Alrighty, and it looks like we are officially live. Uh, some last minute corrections, me filling up the full screen. And hello, everybody. All right, so I understand that typically when you actually look at prehistory uh, in a comprehensive sense, you kind of have a difficult time sort of parsing up everything into digestible little chunks. And so typically people will have a fair amount of familiarity with, let's say, uh, a certain time period, like the Permian. Uh, a lot of people know about the Cambrian, even in general society. Uh, but one period that really gets overlooked a lot is the Silurian. And the Silurian started about 444 million years ago. Uh, it's like 443.8 or something like that. But it basically represents this time where life had recovered from the Indo-Ordovician mass extinction event. Um, in the Ordovician, at the end of the Ordovician, you kind of saw the first plants and fungi sort of colonize land. Uh, but at that time, um, especially towards the beginning of the Silurian, you basically had Gondwana and then a couple of other continents that represented most of uh, Siberia, some of modern Asia and North America uh, higher up. So Gondwana mostly stuck around the South Pole. So most of that land mass was concentrated there. But at this time, the Earth went through a very radical amount of climate change and effects to its biosphere that we really still don't understand. Uh, part of the reason for that is really we're basically just looking at rock layers to kind of determine what happened. It isn't a case of thinking about, oh, uh, do we have this killer meteor? Do we have some smoking gun that tells us exactly how the Ordovician ended? No. And in fact, it's one of the most mysterious mass extinctions that we will ever experience. I think the only other mass extinction that will even rival it in terms of kind of mystery and intrigue will be the uh, the impermian mass extinction event. But even in scenarios like this, we can basically kind of infer, um, we can basically infer some things that are not necessarily taken for granted by the modern literature, but definitely overlooked. The Indoordovician mass extinction event wiped out 85% of all life in the ocean. The ocean only had 15% of its previous biodiversity and all of those taxa, um, and of course, a, a few of them have gone extinct since in like trilobites and ammonites, but most of the taxa that we see today, almost all the modern forms that you're seeing in this aquarium right now, um, all of the fish, definitely the fish, the age of the fish was the Silurians. So all of the chondrichthys, all the chondrichthians, like the sharks and the rays, uh, as well as the osteichthians. So all this, all these actinopteran uh, reef fish, those are all bony fish. And those all came about um, in the Silurian. So the Silurian was actually renowned and kind of interesting, overlooked even because of the fact that it's so short. It only lasted from four, uh, 444 million years ago to around 419 million years ago. So this is only a what 25 million year long period that's pretty uh yeah that's 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 really shocking compared to the lengths of earlier periods so in a 25 million year frame you're essentially getting a a massive radiation of life basically life bouncing back to sort of what it was before and also in, in niches that we didn't even think were possible for example the first forests appear uh in the in the silurian a lot of that coming from prox attack uh prox Oh, I'm really bad with the names, prototaxis, fungi, or whatever. Um, they could grow to be like eight meters tall. And they were just giant spires, just giant um, sporangium that were just growing out of the ground. And we also saw the first vasc vascular plants like Cooksonia around 425 million years ago. So how did all of these innovations really come about? Before this, on land, there had basically been maybe some basal early bryophytes, al algae-like organisms. The, the colonization of land is probably one of the most contentious subjects in the entire fossil record, because not only do we have evidence of very quick and very rapid radiations in terms of diversity and body plan among animals, but we also see that among plants, while simultaneously seeing uh, long stretches, hundreds of million years of history where many plants will change very, very little. I mean, just look at the fact that we have things like liverwort and horsetails in the modern day, both organisms that are absolutely ancient and had previously higher diversity, sure, but who represent incredibly basal forms in the fossil record. Now, 
the issue with both the Cambrian, the Ordovician, and the Silurian, and rather probably what defines them the most, are three periods of incredible bursts in speciation, of biodiversity, and, and changes of physiolo physiology of creatures that up to this point barely resembled uh, worms with flukes or basic creeper, creepy crawlies, but are now resembling forms that we sort of can recognize in the modern day. This is supposedly supported by fossil evidence and supposedly supported by um, extrapolating upon factors we see in microevolution, such as natural and sexual selection. However, I covered, I covered before just how erroneous this view can be when trying to just blanket apply Darwin's observations in the Galapagos to something as complicated and multifaceted as how life bounces back after mass extinction. The main reason I find most of the discussions around the beginning of these geologic periods in paleobiology so unscientific is that we don't have any sort of precedent record or genuine observable evidence of what happens when animals bounce back from mass extinction. What we see is how animals bounce back from disruption, such as primary and secondary succession of new plants after a massive forest fire or after a flood or tsunami. We're not seeing mass breakdown of the food chain, um, destruction of niches, any of that in the modern day. No matter what kind of climate change alarmist, whatever you want to hear, we're not seeing genuine niche collapse. If we did, honestly, it would just be game over for humanity. I mean, what occurs in these mass extinction events is absolutely apocalyptic from the bottom up. It's devastation that you would look at first glance and think that every single organism on the planet has died out that isn't a microbe. It, it's, it's devastating. And what we see from these mass extinction events, the massive drop in biodiversity, we know that it happens because we see all of this diversity in one rock layer and then just above it, like a hard line, we see a, substan a substantial drop um, in biodiversity. Now, there are a few explanations for this that don't have to do with like, well, it's conclusively a mass extinction. One, the type of deposition of mineral could be unsuitable for fossilization, or there could be something else in that environment, such as aridification that would make it unsuitable for fossilization. So therefore, you would have a bias in uh, fossil selection based off how things change in that ecosystem. It may not necessarily mean that animals have died out. It probably just means that the soil is unsuitable, or that's one example. And Geologists are sophisticated enough to know when an animal will sink through multiple sedimentary layers and all that. But honestly, I'm not sure in the modern day with how with how kind of corrupted science has become by money, how meticulous they're actually pressuring that. Because, I mean, it could be one thing to rock the boat, but what will get you more attention, rocking the boat or going along with the status quo? But I'm not going to speak on the field of geology at this point. I'm going to speak purely on the interpretations of the data and the findings. Again, like I've said before, only around 1% to 2% maybe of all biota, of all representative life forms will ever show up on the fossil record. Because as we all know, finding fossils isn't just a matter of having the fossils preserve and mineralize, having those fossils uh, be in a place that's accessible to humans where a human could potentially stumble upon it or look for it deliberately, but also have it uncovered enough to where that human can find it while also not letting it be so uncovered that it whittles away. So every fossil that's exposed is a ticking clock. It, it, it gets exposed and eventually rain and wind and grains of sand are going to grind it into dust eventually. So once a fossil is exposed, it's a race against time to find it. So our fossil record is filled with sparse, incomplete, um, and disarticulated skeletons. Oftentimes species are named just off of a single tooth or molar, like what the Denisovans kind of pulled on us, but we're hoping that we find more material. With things like sharks and chondrichthys, their cartilaginous skeletons don't leave much but teeth. Maybe we have a few impressions here and there from if just absolutely lucky finds, but typically we don't see uh, massive amounts of representations of many of the animals we get from this time period. So a lot of what's in the Ordovician is kind of assumed to just be a teaser of something more. And the older and farther you go back, Honestly, the less and less you'll end up finding, even if you find a really good site, those sites are going to be few and far between just because of how old the rock is. So many of those fossils are either buried so deep underground that you're not going to be able to access them as a human being, or they're in places where they 
suffer a large amount of exposure, like in the British Isles or in the Hell Creek Formation or something, where, yeah, okay, it's really, really a fun time trying to preserve a fossil while there's sandstorms or while there's torrential downpour. So what we do see is a massive increase in biodiversity, like we saw at the beginning of the Ordovician and as we saw in the Cambrian. So why did I decide to title this Silurian shenanigans? Well, it's because scientists, once again, haven't really addressed the mechanism for all this change. Remember, environmental pressure is used a lot in the Silurian to explain a lot of what goes on. There's environmental pressure. The, the first forests and vascular plants um, spontaneously developing from more basal forms, that is explained away um, in the same way that the massive fish radiation was explained away. I think this is fr frozen, but... I might just go to another stream. Hey, what's up, David? How you doing, bro? I'm doing okay. Uh, right now, I'm just gonna break this down like a Walmart shotgun. But the mechanism for change that we're seeing is all the same. All it is, is random alterations to the genome. And the big question in, in zoology and in science in general is how impactful, okay, I'll switch to this one. How impactful is random changes to the genome to the base mutation rate can the base mutation rate actually change in a fundamental way to correspond with the change of environment science has not been able to answer this and it's probably one of the biggest forks in the microevolution to macroevolution extrapolation where you just take microevolutionary principles and blow them up i'm like well microevolution deals with established genetics it's you're manipulating the genome the way you manipulate a dog's genome. The dog already has the genetic capacity to change size or to change muzzle shape or to change color. Those genes are already present in the dog. They just have to be bred for those traits. They're not mutations. A Chihuahua and a Great Dane are built from the same genetic material. They're both dogs. They're genetically identical. Very little, ba very few base pair changes actually go into the difference between a Chihuahua and a, and a, and a Great Dane or a Greyhound or whatever dog you want to pick because they're gene expression comes from the same template there they just have a different assemblage of the same base genes you'd find in most dog populations their genes are still the same it's just which genes are activated which genes aren't which recessives have multiple copies which lead to their expression which dominants don't have enough copies to where the expression is co-dominant it gets really complicated genetics is really in its infancy and people acting like they have a we have a solid perfect idea of biochemical comparison and DNA analysis, they need to take a step back and, you know, eat a slice of humble pie because especially with how epigenetics has come to the fore, the fact that, you know, environment may influence the expression of genes, at least, it's going to be difficult to tell me that in the face of overwhelming evidence that minor changes to the genome can lead to drastic changes in the physiology. So let's take Let's take lactose tolerance or lighter skin. You do have a plethora of genes that, you know, oh, a gene came out of nowhere. Um, first of all, th there's this idea that entire proteins can be formed from a, from a mutation, that a mutation happens and suddenly you have all the necessary equipment to create a brand new protein, but you don't. Most mutations are point mutations that mostly affect how the protein is ultimately expressed or shaped in a way that either makes it more or less efficient. Um, you could have a protein deficiency, uh, you know, lacking an expression of a protein. You could have a protein slightly altered, but that's what we mostly see from actual mutation. Lactose tolerance is uh, just the ability to, for the body to persistently produce lactase into adulthood. Instead of shutting off um, the factory process that um, produces lactase, like what typically happens in adult mammals, our bodies instead, like in my body, there's a gene, that mutation, several mutations from milk that simply just prevent that from shutting off that's all it does it's not a brand new gene that comes from scratch however vascular plants coming from bryophytes or all of these primitive fish coming from uh these really primitive chordates it, it's a difficult sell for the reason that everybody kind of points to the cambrian if you're looking at the time scale 25 million years you're getting changes in physiology you're getting radiations into new niches. The creation of new niches in the first place, the terrestrial ecosystem now has a forest niche, like a, a wetland forest niche. And you're getting that all explained away by environmental pressure and natural selection. 
But the issue with both of those things is natural selection happens within a niche. Natural selection is an intra-niche principle. Animals can't survive outside of their niche unless they already have adaptations that allow them to exploit that niche. So I brought up before in an earlier stream about the hamsters on a desert island. If you have an island and like, you know, hamsters, you know, they'll, they have a, they have a pretty varied diet. You know, they, they eat nuts, they're, they're rodents. So, you know, they typically think of the, the general omnivore kind of insectivore seed eater diet that you would see from a rodent in the wild, especially something like a guinea pig. And then stranded on an island where the only thing that grows are date palms and a few fruiting trees and grasses, you could kind of see how they would survive, right? Like they would just eat the fruits, like maybe they'd eat some seaweed that wash up on the beach. And you could see how guinea pigs could adapt to probably a more arboreal niche just by exploiting the genes that they already had in their toolkit. Okay, maybe they have to adapt their gut to survive on a more frugivore diet than they're accustomed to. Maybe... Um, there's more insects on this island. Maybe they go more insect route. Maybe there's a divergence between those two. And that's what we see on island ecosystems. We see a higher amount of biodiversity on islands because they have to make more in a more constricted space. So you do see a lot of niche partitioning in a intra or I guess micro evolutionary scale that happens within a population. So all these Galapagos finches, for example, can readily hybridize and often do. Um, and there we see a, another principle come to the fore in microevolution that really is incompatible with mac macroevolution, and that's outbreeding depression and hybridization. In some instances, a hybrid uh, can function perfectly well. If two different size beaked finches have offspring and they're medium size, as long as they can find medium sized seeds or what have you, then typically the hybrid will be successful. And oftentimes they can form their own independent quote unquote species. Um, even though genetically speaking, they may be very identical to other uh, species in the environment. But oftentimes we see hybrids that don't. Oh, this stream is giving me trouble. But oftentimes you see species that just don't, that they'll have hybrids that are, that are sterile or beyond that. They're just not well adapted to their environment. So instead of having, I might have to switch to the YouTube aquariums. Hold up. So instead of having actually a decent, a decent grasp on the mechanisms at play. Instead, they're all hand waved. They're all basically kind of brushed up and made to look all reasonable because you have all of these, oh, well, look at the Eurypterids. You had them um, going into the niches that many of the earlier Ammonites uh, were occupying or something. Like you would have Eurypt these massive Eurypterids uh, come to the fore and even small Eurypterids from pretty basic um, horseshoe crab-like ancestors like Cyphosura. But how do you get there? Even if that niche for apex predator is wide open, how do you go from pond scum eating crab thing to a hostile sea scorpion predator? I think, again, the earlier cat analogy I used is very poignant. Say for that same island where the guinea pigs washed up, instead in their place, cats washed up. So no guinea pigs, just cats. What would you end up getting? What would you end up getting? Eventually, you just get a, a, an island full of starving cats. That's what you get. I mean, there's no there's no contest here about what'll happen if you if, if you drop a bunch of cats on an island with no food to eat. To them, there is no food. They're not going to suddenly adapt to eat fruit. They're not going to suddenly evolve the ability to digest grass. What's going to happen is. All right, Monterey Bay Aquarium it is. You can't copyright me. This is fair use. So let me fill that up. Yeah. Okay, so basically what you're getting is a bunch of cats that will starve because cats are, cats are obligate carnivores. Their physiology has to change fundamentally to exploit this frugivore niche. So they have all of the arboreal adaptations, but they lack the ability to metabolize this fruit and all of this stuff. There's no generations of adaptation. There's no hoping for a random change to come by to make them survive we see extinction happen passively. I mean, man, man's control over, over life on earth is, is not as great as people think it is. Extinctions happen passively all the time. Passive extinction is actually one of the most accepted and probably the most vocifer vociferously advocated for aspects of natural history. We know that extinction is a thing now, but we know that men aren't the primary drivers of mass extinction. We, we see that natural disaster mass habitat conversion and the collapse of the global food chain, that's what causes mass extinction. 
But is that population pressure enough? If the cats had to survive, is force of will alone enough to justify generations of change? And this is a persistent theme. How much is this environmental pressure actually explaining away the radical changes that we're seeing for creatures that at one point were just a single cartilage in a tube filled with fluid, no jaws, they look like modern lampreys, and suddenly what, their gill arches metamorph into jaws, and they start filling all these needs, they radiate, there's ones that have ossified skeletons, so they deposit calcium carbonate um, in the form of ca calcium hydroxyapatite into their skeletons, then you have the chondrichthians that remain cartilaginous, but they have um, much more stronger enamel deposition in their teeth. And then you have the placoderms, which have gone extinct, but they actually um, mineralize their, their integument, their scales and their skin. And you have all these rapid changes like, oh, teeth coming from scales and then the jaws forming and all this stuff. And we have these images from the fossil record. But the issue with using solely using comparative anatomy and solely relying upon the fossil record to answer these questions is that when you then use DNA in the modern day to try to justify these relations between animals, like the connection between hippos and whales, and then using that to justify Pachycetus, which I'll cover uh, uh, later once I get to the, the Eocene, which is going to be spicy. The my, I'm gonna, I've been like Eye of the Tiger in this Eocene episode for a long time. I've, I've probably been preparing more for the Eocene than any other period in history so far. But the Silurian is very important because here we see all of the modern fish and all of the modern forms that we'd associate with like arachnids and hexapods, and crustaceans, all of these forms, if they didn't arrive before, they've arrived now. The Devonian is, is a, also a big time of expansion, but most of the basal forms of life have essentially emerged at this time. And one could say it all came back to the Cambrian, which is true, but many species died out at the end of Ordovician. Um, again, 85% of life at that time, and only 15% only of Earth's biodiversity remained. That's not even one-sixth of the species. That's, that's, that, that's, a, that's a devastating blow to the planet's ecology. But the reshuffle we saw, the expansion into niches, what causes this adaptive radiation? According to um, evolutionary science, this is explained by natural selection primarily. These animals that get this mutation survive, and then they pass it on. But how many mutations do you need to have in order to justify this rate of change? You're seeing species completely change their physiology in just 10 million years time. The vascular structures that plants need to exist on land, if they don't exist in earlier plant forms, then where are they coming from? We're, we're basically being told that every single, every single feature of these plants was just, it all just came together. You need xylem and phloem and uh, increased cellulose in your tissues uh, you don't need to be lignified yet. You're not true wood, but in like to just get a vascular plant out of, out of like a bryophyte, it's a hard transition. And that, and that's what brings us back to outbreeding in order to occupy a completely novel niche. You need to make yourself less adapted to your current niche or fundamentally change your physiology in a way that you're going to have to adapt the way you survive, which is very difficult for animals to do. Again, natural selection is what's being used to justify this, but natural selection works against outbreeding and changes of the physiology that affect its, your current placement in a niche. These things are at odds. If natural selection is the mechanism by which animals radiate to these niches, then how can it also be the mechanism by which animals no longer enter into other niches? So you're, you're basically stuck between a paradox where natural selection both conserves niches and also what promotes evolution or evolutionary change or the impetus to, to change. And this is why Lamarckism is a thing because we know that wanting to reach the, the leaves of a tree won't make a deer grow a longer neck, even though that niche is available to the deer, especially in the moment, the deer would have to make that a consistent part of its diet or something analogous to where maybe it doesn't feed on tall trees. Maybe it feeds on medium sized shrubs. And over time, it just gets bigger and bigger to where it could exploit both the shrubs and the trees. I could see a scenario where animals would naturally increase in size. Again, microevolutionarily, a population of wolves under the under the right pressures could become Great Danes or Chihuahuas. And then we definitely say they'd be different species, even if their genome uh, genome was the same, which is what we're doing to giraffes at the moment. Uh, but the difference between giraffes and these animals in the Silurian is that the, the radical changes happening to these creatures are fundamental. 
it's changes to your skeleton, it's changes to your dentition, it's changes to your method of respiration, it's changes to the cardiovascular system or the vascular. I mean, the vascular plants are literally named for the fact that they have vessels that transect their entire bodies. So maybe they develop from earlier forms. The, the, the vessels were just going up and whatever. Um, you could say that there is a slow progressive march towards vascular tissues, but what guides that process? Because we still have, again, it's like people bring this up and they act like it's like it's not a point or something, but we still have bryophytes. Like bryophytes work perfectly fine. I don't, I don't see where the benefit of becoming a vascular plant factored into their sudden decision to what gain vascular tissues. Like we don't know the impetus for gaining vascular tissues. We just know that it happened because we see the plants and the fossil record justify it. But if the impetus of change were positively selected traits via natural via natural selection, then it's a hard sell. And I don't know why scientists fail to see that. The hard sell comes from the fact that nature is inherently conservative. The genome is inherently conservative. Again, previous stream, I detailed how you have three different mechanisms in your nucleus to prevent UV damage to your DNA. Your DNA won't, won't only catch mutations, but they'll actively try to correct them if they're caught. This is why not, not only are mutations exceedingly rare, to be expressed, but also the fact that negative muta uh, mutations that result in deformity are very oftentimes deselected immediately while neutral mutations persist solely by a factor of genetic drift and the latent size of the population. And so this is where it becomes difficult to sort of parse things too, because we see many animals follow that trend. In fact, a large plethora of modern animals and especially modern plants follow the trend of niche conservatism and even physiological conservatism. The horseshoe crabs, which were around during this era, are still alive today in almost an identical form. And we know because of the fossil record, coelacanths have been physiologically basically consistent for 70 million years, and they're sarcopterygians, they're osteichthians. So their ancestors were around during this period, but the actual modern coelacanth has been around that long. Frilled sharks, again, like I mentioned before, are in the same boat, but people never talk about things like gymnosperms. They never talk about bryophytes. They never talk about uh, ferns and ginkgos and all of these different plants that have been around for tens of millions and sometimes hundreds of millions of years. If we, if we actually look back at the fossil record, we see a large amount of diversity happening after these mass extinctions, where we don't know the origin of the mass extinction, we don't know the origin of the, of the radiation, we parse it all down to natural selection, like that's just like the one-all, be-all answer to what we see happening in the fossil record that defies rational explanation. If it truly was just random alterations to the genome, would we actually see what we see today? The Richard Linsky experiments in the 80s, 1986, I believe, and I could pull it up again, but in the 80s, the Richard Linsky experiment went on for 15 years to measure the rate of genomic change among asexually producing E. coli. And it's one of the first things I covered in my original stream, but it pointed out that any genomic change whatsoever you could have beneficial adaptations, especially in the realm of disease. That's actually where we mostly see uh, novel genetic anything coming about. But to take mechanisms that we know are well established for adapting to a parasite or a virus or you know a warning system or antigen to help deal with a bacteria and saying that animals are going to be, oh yeah, that same mechanism is leading to massive changes in the physiology and the time it took chimps and gorillas to diverge. It's hard, it's a hard sell. And as I'm going to cover uh, the future land to sea or sea to land transition in the Devonian, which is going to be a wild ride, I'm going to bring a lot of what I've said here and in previous streams to the fore with that one, because again, the Devonian and the, um, the magical shape shifting that had to happen and go from use the Nopteron, um, to Tolperdon and the first, uh, land animals is like, I, I'm, I'm just going to save it for the Devonian, uh, even though I've hinted at it before. But in Silurian, you get the first taste of this enigma. What actually causes this mass radiation? And during these streams, I typically don't am actively give out, like, inferences or proposed solutions to these problems because they are still unanswerable. I mean, I can't sit here and give you anything else but a religious answer if if you if you want an answer, that's why this is here. So this is why we keep need to need to keep studying this with an open mind. We don't have the answers, and one of the issues in modern academia is that they act like they do. They these people, because they've spent ten years in school and have letters after their names and have to justify it, will sit there 
and bullshit you to your face that they know exactly what's going oh it's this this and this and back then oh we know that most likely it was this and this and it's like this is indistinguishable to a religion in my opinion this is indistinguishable to an ideology this isn't science this is idealism you want to create or fabricate or beg the question concerning how the earth was created and the heat death of the universe but you don't actually have the data to back it up. You don't have the scientific method to, to push that. When I first talked about abiogenesis and kicked off this entire uh, series, it all started with, yet with, with Louis Pasteur. The Pasteur experiments definitively proved you cannot get life from nothing. He disproved all these people like, oh, where maggots generate from rotting flesh out of nowhere. No, you need a biological origin for biology. Life does not come from inert matter no matter how perfect it is like he used chicken soup and sealed glass flasks to demonstrate even though this soup is perfect for microbes to grow and spoil the sealed flask will not spoil ever and it still hasn't it's been going on for over a century and it still has not spoiled it's still fresh chicken soup why is that because only life can be get life it is one of the most fundamental principle pillars of biology and yet scientists want to river dance all over that. They want to come in here with their cult and their new age religion because they're the they're the priests of this new religion. And they want to tap dance all over that, acting like RNA can self-assemble and that's so, like cell membranes can self-assemble, that they can, you know, come together like Goku and Vegeta and create a Gogeta life form that becomes the first life. And then all life comes from that. And that's really what this is doing. It's all to kind of tie everything back into that one ancestor that's the goal of mac, mac revolution micro revolution we know is is a testable and observable science that we can rely upon to do experiments and to reliably extract you know how are we going to help an animal how are we going to solve this problem how are we going to help mitigate the disasters that are affecting animals in the modern day scientists are not obsessed with that they're obsessed with proving that there is no god that everything's random and that comes from nothing and that we're all here because of you know, random monkeys fucking in the Serengeti and deciding to take a leisure stroll in the open plain. It's not to uphold science. It's There's nothing objectively scientific about saying that natural selection is, is the primary driver along with random changes to the genome for all of the biodiversity we see. So if we actually look at the Silurian, we also see the first arthropods arrive on land in three separate radiations independent of each other. So these animals, three different lineage, underwent massive physiological changes to every system in their body to, to now occupy land. Um, it's principally the myriapoda, so all the centipedes and millipedes. It's the arachnids, so the acarians, so the mites, and then, of course, our titular spider arachnids, and then also um, the scorpions. Then we have, lastly, uh, the hexapods and crustaceans. Um, so hexapods are technically crustaceans, phylogenetically speaking, whatever. Uh, but they arrived on the scene too, and the later isopods would also come onto land. So we have, you know, minimum three, maximum four different uh, invertebrate lineages arriving onto land. And then we had the gastropods, which makes five, uh, that came later on too. But it's like you look at all these colonizations of land, all these animals rapidly changing their physiology, and you have to ask yourself, is it really natural selection doing this natural selection should keep them in their niche should keep them right doing what they're doing to make them survive as best as they can if conditions change they either die or adapt and that's been the rule in history forever it, you should be adapting within your niche no apex predator is suddenly going to be able to fill the niche of a meso predator a cat's not going to suddenly get the stomach for grazing on grass oh man it washed up on this island continent that's nothing but pure alfalfa and daisies for as far as the eye can see it's just a paradise for a grazing animal beautiful and these cats doesn't matter if there's five cats or 500 cats doesn't matter if they're big small striped or polka dotted every single one is going to starve to death absolutely and that's what we see animals cannot just suddenly like oh wow there's this niche and i'm being out competed for my current niche i guess i'll magically adapt to this new niche so i don't get out competed that's not enough you're 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 not going to be it's it's easier for an animal and this is natural selection determines this it is easier for an animal to try and eke out a place in its current niche competing with an invasive animal or the changes in the in the ecosystem than it is to carve out a completely new niche 
out of nowhere, out of thin air, radically changing. It's like it's like putting all it's like betting everything on black in an evolutionary sense. Why in the hell would an animal go out of its way to make itself less adapted to its current niche and potentially die out just for some vague, somehow justified decision to what make a transition onto land? It's like, okay, so I'm going to make my gills less efficient and make my body um, and, and decalcify my body and go through all of these changes to help me live on land, which all just make it suck all the more to be in the water. And of course, hexapods still live in the water, but the transition to go from land to water or water to land both ways is, is an incredibly complicated and deeply transformative process. It is not something that can be simply explained by, oh, this animal thought this animal was cute, or, oh, this just helped it survive better. It's like it either can make it or it doesn't. And land to water is such an extreme transition. It's th There's no niche transition on earth that compares to land to sea. Not for, even, the, even the analogy of cats, uh, even the cat to grass is not equivalent because, I, I mean, it, it's, it is literally like dumping a cat off with like a log it can it's like okay well this cat needs to now uh get used to hunting animals the only foods in the water so like it's on a desert island the only foods on the water like yeah maybe you will get fisher cats you know we see fisher cats the cat will go and catch fish but is a cat gonna become an otter in 10 million years because it's it, oh it's gonna adapt to that and then fill up an aquatic niche i'm like well a cat can try but a cat is ultimately a terrestrial animal it's just like with a let, let's take let's take a sea slug. Like, is that going to eventually make the land to sea uh, or sea to land transition? Difficult to tell. We do see semi-aquatic animals like otters and seals and sea lions, but none of those animals are transitioning into being fully aquatic or not fully aquatic. The sea lion, in fact, relies on having greater land mobility because even though they're more maneuverable in water, they don't have the same flat speed as seals, and they can't survive in the same range of environments as seals. So they both have benefits the sea lions often outcompete seals when they overlap so it's funny sea lions which are actually more terrestrial than seals outcompete their more aquatic cousins when their ranges overlap because they typically do better in securing beach space funny how that works it's almost like evolution isn't just a blind march forward even though scientists will claim this they still don't actually say this so they might claim over oh, evolution isn't just a march it's about a bunch of things that work and the sea lions uh, outcompeting the seals is you know, that's just, you know, you never know what evolution is going to do. It's like, but your entire fossil record explanation for things relies on this beautiful, seamless march and transformation from a land animal to a sea animal to exploit a niche. These marine mammals exploit these niches because they're still adapted enough to the water that they still have to breathe air. These early hexapods and eventually uh, early lungfish completely change their cardiovascular and respiratory systems to survive on land. Whales today don't use gills, but fish gained lungs and came onto land. So that's that's where everybody kind of has to pump the brakes. The Silurian is the beginning of the shenanigans. The, the, the Cambrian is still a mystery. At least they admit that the Cambrian's a mystery. But the mechanism for change that they're going with, the rate of evolution that they're working with, and the evidence that we see from microevolution to justify or maybe not justify massive radiations and species after mass extinctions, it all begins here, because if you ever learn about the Silurian, it'll just be hand waved. Oh, yeah, 25 million years. That's plenty of time for every kind of animal on Earth to bounce back from a mass extinction and create all these new niches. I mean, it's just natural selection. And that's unironically what we're being told to believe, that this is the main driver of natural selection, and random changes in the genome. That's enough to explain this. But it really isn't. If you look at the background mutation rate of animals, if if animals if animals would have to have a mutation rate, and this, and this is the same in every period. I'm going to bring this up in the Eocene too, but the mutation rates and the way that they change aren't explained. How does the mutation rate change? How is the mutation rate great enough to go from drastically different humans? Let's, let's say even human beings, because I'm going to cover this later. You know, human beings 600,000 years ago, much different looking than humans 300,000 years ago. But humans 300,000 years ago were still anatomically modern. They try to like backpedal and say like, oh, well, 75,000 years ago, um, a human wouldn't be able to survive in modern society. And that's a crock of absolute horse shit. I don't even know who first said that. I think it was like, was, was it Sagan or, or Chomsky? It was, it was some 
some random philosopher or something pulled that claim completely out of their ass. Humans have been biologically modern, especially ever since this Morocco finds like we did, we've been biologically modern for the last 200, 300,000 years. But if you go back a further 200, 300,000 years, miraculously, we go from basically ape men with giant brows and, you know, Homo heidelbergensis and shit. And we then go from Homo heidelbergensis, 300,000 years of steady change, absolute change in the physiology. And then boom, 300,000 years ago, anatomically modern humans, and we stayed anatomically modern ever since. Yeah, we've diverged into races, whatever. But we've stayed anatomically modern ever since then. All modern humans have the same core features, even though we can tell apart our different races and stuff by skeletal features. There's there's enough shared features here to where we're all anatomically modern humans. We have our bones have not changed enough to justify um, an, an absolute species transition. But Homo heidelbergensis still became modern Homo sapiens and also Neanderthal, supposedly. You know, all of this in in early anthropology and the same thing is kind of used here it's like oh well you know all of these early chordates they became the the jawfish the the gnathostomes and then the agnathans and then oh those those fish split apart into the chondrichthians who only had cartilage but some ossified their skeletons they, they became the osteopians and they had fins suddenly and those grew to make them more balanced in water and to act as rudders and then those uh, osteopians split into the actinopterans which had a certain fin uh, composition while the more internally developed uh, bone structure of the Sarcopterygians laid the groundwork for life to eventually come onto land. The current ancestors of lungfish and all of these, uh, pfft, whoa, whoa, the coelacanth and all these are all descended from Sarcopterygians, all the other fish. 95% of fish species are descended from the Actinopterygians. That's what you learn in school. But they never actually explain why all these changes happen. They're both occupying similar niches, both going certain routes, but for some reason, fishes went through all these changes. And where does natural selection play in? You know, like, why didn't all fish adopt the same strategy? If they're all filling the same niches coming out of this mass extinction event, or similar niches, they're all filling these aquatic niches, it's like, oh, why did chondrichthians get here? Why did act? We don't know. And instead of saying we don't know, they want to explain, they want to pull out all these cockamamie theories of why sharks didn't actually have a calcified skeleton, or why the why the osteichthians did have a calcified skeleton or where jaws came from what made the gill arches metamorphose into jaws and what made scales migrate into the mouth and become teeth it's like instead of asking how did all this happen it's like what is it's like what what caused this to happen what is the mechanism by which this changed random mutation that's it like random mutation that yeah oh i have to hope that the scales just get a little bit closer to my mouth so that they become teeth eventually, it's like that's what's being proposed. That somehow some transitionary gene is going to be positively selected for and just miraculously become ubiquitous in the population or some segment of it, and then another alteration is made that makes it better, but oh, it's still not functional. And this is this is where irreductible complexity comes in. Irreductible complexity, which I covered uh, when I first talked about the cell, it's any structure that just won't work unless it's just fully formed. Jaws work this way and teeth work this way. The jaws of fish, like a jawless fish, uses a completely different set of muscles and mechanisms to swallow and capture prey than jawfish do. Jawfish, these, all of these bones, the quadrato jugal, all of these uh, bones of the jaw, the dentary bone, it all comes supposedly from gill arches that exist in fish for helping them acquisition prey or create negative delta pressure to suck them in. But why fish gain jaws, the process by which they gain jaws, the, the genes that had to exist to create functioning jaws, the musculature attachments um, on the jaws to justify that. I mean, in the human being, you have the temporalis and masseter muscles mostly connecting to the jaw that affect the way you bite. But you have to create those muscles out of thin air if you want functioning jaws in a fish. And they don't have exactly temporalis and masseter muscles, but where are the muscles? It's like the issues that come from this are if the muscles are too weak, then the jaws are useless. If the jaws don't have working teeth, then they're ultimately not doing much better than the jawless fish. And if the jaws are too weak or if the gill arch isn't supported enough or whatever, um, it, it's just, it, it's such a drastic pill to swallow. It's such a drastic change to the physiology that it's hard to explain by natural selection. So many of the changes that would have to happen, like the fusing of gill arches, would be seen as deformities. Um, if those mutations occurred, you can't say that it's a positive mutation to have gill arches fusing, right? 
because the more your gill are just fused, the less efficient your gills become. You have to change your gill morphology to actually go through with the formation of jaw structure. These things are not explained. Or if they are explained, again, they're hand waved away. They're not actually taken seriously. So even then, it, the, the transition from the, the book gill to the book lung that, that arachnids underwent, or the transition from uh, gill structures to trachea that, that hexapods underwent, Again, massive fundamental changes in respiration that we just don't see in microevolutionary principle today. We don't see any animal, even the most adapted and specialized aquatic mammal, still breathes air. There's no lung to gill transition. And with mudskippers, same thing, even with lungfish. It's like lungfish, they don't have vascularized lungs like we do, but they still have gills and lungs. So we see even in modern day, animals don't just radically change the way they breathe oxygen. I mean, if you're going to, if you're going to fuck with anything, the least thing you're going to fuck with is how you breathe air or take in oxygen. It's like, you can go a month without food and go three days without water. You can go like a minute or two without oxygen. So to, to fundamentally mess with the way you take in oxygen, just to magically jump between this barren niche with some moss and like moss in it, Oh, there's a lot of moss to eat. Like there isn't a lot of algae to eat in the ocean. Oh, well, we're, we're washed up on shore during high tide and we can survive the trip back. And it's like, we see a lot of those animals where they're temporary terrestrial visitors, like her, like uh, some hermit crab species and others, hermit's crab species that become terrestrial, like our favorite coconut crabs, for example. But, you know, that, that transition is still very much tied to the shore. It's like the idea that, okay, now they're going to decalcify their skeletons. I mean, that's cool. Uh, but again, coconut crabs and hermit crabs are so intrinsically tied to the water. I mean, the, the coconut crabs have to spend their early life in aquatic ecosystems. They, they still have to get, get into shells that are dropped by aquatic gastropods. So even though you could point to an animal like, oh, that's a transitionary form, that's that. There is no transitionary form in nature. These animals have a niche. They're adapted to littoral zones, uh, near shore reefs. They're not fully terrestrial. Uh, and so trying to act like, oh, well, maybe they came from these animals and they, then they made the land transition. So they would have to change basically everything, even the reprodu reproductive system, uh, their breeding habits. They'd have to change every single behavior that they were used to in an aquatic environment. And then they would have to go through all the physio physiological changes along with that. So it's not just biology, it's ethology, it's behavior. So animals not only have to fundamentally change the biology, they also have to adapt to a completely new uh, slew of behaviors um, and these are not highly derived, highly intelligent organisms. These are fish. These are basal fish. They're not even as intelligent as modern fish. They're, they're basically as primitive of fish that you can get. And yet they're somehow supposed to intelligently change behavior to adapt to these extremely radical and quick changes in their physiology. Like, oh, yeah, I'm going to adapt all these behaviors that allow me to survive on land and be an effective life form. And it's just going to take a little bit of what? Gusto? A little bit of time and elbow grease? And yet we don't see that in modern creatures. We don't see animals changing their behavior on a whim to suddenly exploit a new resource because most of them don't have the capacity to change their behavior so suddenly. It literally is impossible for a, a zebra to change its stripes or a le leopard to change its spots. These animals are adapted already to these specific ecosystems and these specific behaviors. And most of the time, these behaviors are purely instinctual. So even if this animal in a reef ecosystem is could make a land dress. Let's say, oh, the fully terrestrial hermit crab that never goes back to land and hunts down uh, land snails to get their shells. I'm like, I could, I could actually kind of see that. But will that hermit crab now develop the genes to decalcify its skeleton? And now will it be able to change its behaviors to purely seek out these land snails and hunt them down, or or to search for their shells, develop the the sniffing structures, the ability to sense out the terrestrial snail shell and be able to adapt to how they get about and move along, track their habits. Maybe they'll sniff out their slime trail or something. And then they have to figure out, okay, what are we actually going to feed on now? It's like all of these things from A to Z that have to happen can't be explained by natural selection because every single one of those changes is a massive obstacle. Every single one is an obstacle. It's a, it's a challenge to overcome for a life form. And what we know from natural selection is that life abhors challenges. They want to make life as easy as possible for themselves gazelles aren't born with short stumpy legs they're born you know precocial able to run within minutes of being born why because it's not there's no challenge in nature that nature will put on put upon itself deliberately it's like well you know i've decided that 
there's a lot of space underground. I think instead of being an Impala, I think my lineage should become burrowing animals. Or I think my lineage should go into the water and become a whale. Which is basically what we're being told. We're being basically told that this Lamarckist view of, oh, these animals want to exploit this niche because there's no competition there. But how does that make any sense? These animals aren't adapted to that niche. It doesn't matter. And that's like being told, like, well, man, you say there's a housing crisis, but pff, there's tons of space on Mars. Why aren't you on Mars? It's like, how am I going to get to Mars, bro? How? How am I getting to Mars? Okay, you say there's a lot of, oh, there's a lot of cheap land on Mars. I bet it's going for a penny an acre on Mars. But there's nothing on Mars for me. And that's what every single creature in the water is thinking when they look upon land. I don't care how green and perfect land is. I don't care if land has hookers and blackjack and stripper poles uh, coming out of the ground, like all those, all those fungus. It's like, it doesn't matter. And ultimately, I, I just can't sit here and look at the Silurian anymore without thinking just like, it's just the beginning of all the nonsense you're going to hear later. Okay, let's see what... Okay, David says he'll be right back, but I, I will uh, I will answer his question. Put all the crazy cat ladies to a small island and see what happens. Yeah, sounds about right. I think, uh, I think uh, what was that? It was like that, that gender challenge. I, I, it wasn't Naked and Afraid. It was like Survival Island, and they had the guy on it. And the girl island and like the girl island just like completely fell apart. It was it was really embarrassing. Well, they fight each other, cooperate. That is science. Yeah, I think the science is uh science is settled. Science is settled. Yeah. But yeah, so the the other thing, yeah, like it says about the fish riding the bicycle. It's it's honestly almost worse. Because at least a bicycle, riding a bicycle is simply just doing one task. The task is riding a bicycle. Um, and I'll cover this in the Devonian when I talk to the, the, the sea to land transition, which was just a, a 15 million year affair from 385 million years ago to 360 million years ago. And fully, fully aquatic lungfish became fully terrestrial amphibians um, in, in that time frame. And it's, it's not just riding the bicycle. It's knowing how to change change the chain of when it falls off. It's it's knowing how to how to keep it polished. It's knowing how to paint the bicycle. It's it's knowing where to store the bicycle. It's knowing how to pump up the tires or fix the spokes or do literally anything to it. It's everything because fundamentally speaking, I know it's like, you know, David isn't currently here to hear this. Uh, maybe you can rewatch or something, but the fish riding the bicycle is actually 10 times easier than what's actually being purported. Uh, what's actually being purported is magical shape shifting animals that are getting to this place and supposedly just butterfly stroking through all of the physiological changes needed to survive on land. And unfortunately that's, that's not really what we're seeing, but I'll keep, I'll keep this up for now. We'll see if David comes back. I, I don't know. I kind of want to see what the other streams are doing. Are you back up? Earth cam. There we go. Yeah, the Earth cam's back. National aquarium. Yeah, very good. Very good aquarium skills. I, I like these guys. But yeah, the Silurian. I know other other streams and you can see from my other streams like they're oh they're an hour long two hours long uh something in that breath just like with so many other subjects i want to do the silurian it's due justice so what are we seeing in the silurian we're not just seeing one lineage radiate you know it like i've said this radiation effect every affected every animal every organism that we kind of see in the modern day all land funky began i mean the, the fungus was the largest terrestrial organism on the planet at this time so when you get the first vascular plants when you're getting the first land arthropods of all major lineages when you're getting the first basically all of the the templates for modern fish when you're getting uh, sea scorpions like eustonopteron hitting the scene and and kicking ass and taking names what caused this to happen like what what was what was the impetus really that was suddenly like oh well 
I guess it's land land time. I guess it's time to go into land. I guess it's time to radiate into all these niches or create these niches out of thin air. What caused that? Because unlike other periods, there was complete niche collapse here. There was complete niche collapse at the beginning of Silurian. There was no, oh, we took a massive hit. It's like, no, there were no forests on land. There were no vascular plants before this. The only thing that was on land were maybe pond scum, I don't know, some bryophytes and early lichen, maybe. I mean, there's not even really solid evidence for there being things like any anything more complex than what you would find at, on the, the bottom of the rock in the redwood forest or something. Like maybe you would find some basic microbes, maybe a bacterial mat. It's like life on land was so whack and so unproductive. And then suddenly you just had an entire land niche appear out of thin air. So what's the justification for that? It's not just a transition of niches. Now it's a question of what causes a niche to emerge in the first place. And that's a sticky one for natural selection. How does the niche create itself? How are animals supposed to adapt to a niche that doesn't exist? That's hard. And that's that's where, again, it's like adapting to a niche that doesn't currently exist or a, a niche in the making is a hard sell for, na for a natural selection uh, a natural selection argument. Because again, how are you supposed to positively select for a trait in an environment that isn't going to positively select for it yet because it doesn't exist? Or maybe there's some other factor that helps to survive in another niche and that just so happens to work in this niche. But we don't really, we kind of know that vascular plants were a land-based thing and that any vascular plants that we know of now kind of reverse colonize the water. They didn't emerge in the water and then get onto land. It was a land innovation. So plants are able to get larger and more complex as a result of vascularization, but the actual method for vascularization is never explained. And similarly, we see these massive changes in physiology happening everywhere, everywhere, in every animal lineage that we've observed in the Silurian. So this short 25 million year period saw some of the most biodiversification that we'll ever see again in the fossil record. So... Until we get to, and that's something that's staggering, that people don't believe it. They're like, well, what about the Triassic? What about uh, the Jurassic with the rise of the dinosaurs? Doesn't mean shit because the dinosaurs are the dinosaurs. They're not literally every single family and life form on the planet. We saw, you know, there, there, of course, there were lineages like the giant, uh, you know, like the giant ammonite squid, like roaming the oceans at that time. Cause it's, I guess they're different. I forget their exact name. But there, there are a lot of species that took fat L's in the Ordovician. and I can go back and pull up all the animals that took fat L's. I'm talking fat L's. But the animals that came back, they're like, oh, well, all these niches opened up. But what does that mean? The niche had opened up. It means that these an animals before them had found a specific way to live and that somehow now these animals are going to find that exact same way to live despite already having their own way to live. That, okay, I can see an animal getting bigger. Like, I can see how... Um, a, a eurypterid would just grow in size to fill an apex better than each if no, nothing else was there. But all the other physiological changes to make it dominant are what's the question. It's like, okay, it knows to get bigger, but does it know to have all of these changes happen to it? But that's an easier pill to swallow. Like I can see how an eohippus can become a mesohippus by natural selection. But the idea that we can get the first arachnids out of relatives of Eusthenoptera. The fact that a sea scorpion can become a fully terrestrial arachnid after changing its lung structure, after changing its its bodily physiology, it's just that is it's just not comparable. It's not comparable. We do, we can't explain away all this diversification and especially the land to sea tra uh, the land to sea or sea to land transition. That is such a hard barrier to cross biologically and yet we saw it happen across kingdoms <laughs> we, we see we saw it happen with plants fungi and animals and these invertebrates and later in the devonian we'll see it with the with the tetrapods too but what is the mechanism for this it's all explained by the same two principal factors but those two principal factors are not sufficient to explain away all of why this happened but not only the why but the how and the what is not properly extrapolated upon and so you get people brushing over periods like this, where every single animal in this aquarium, even the reefs, even the anthozoans, 
uh, during this period, period massively, uh, massively diversified. So literally this entire aquarium, it, 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 without the Silurian period, every single body plan and feature you see here came from the Silurian, basically. It's the first time we saw all of these different types of fish really emerge. So if you want to sit here and say that every single one of these lineages just came about randomly as they try to fill up niches and it was just quote unquote natural selection or random mutation that caused this, then go right ahead. But the science does not support you. And if you want to say that microevolution scaled up as macroevolution and that's what's happening here, just like with the Galapagos Islands, it's like the Galapagos Silurian. Sure, go right ahead. But again, the science does not support you. What the science says is that there is something more going on pertaining to the radiation of animals, especially in, in scenarios of mass niche collapse. Times where you might expect the entire planet to be forever devastated, instead you see the opposite. You see massive radiations into quote-unquote niches that don't even exist yet. Niches creating themselves, new niches emerging, and all of it's being explained away by ability to survive on an on a organism-to-organism scale. Like That's enough to cause these massive linear transformations in their biology and physiology just because they inherently know to exploit a niche to survive somehow magically. So that's, that's where it loses me. That's where, that's where it really loses me when it comes to uh, the Silurian period. Um, oh, I forgot I can zoom in, but I'm going to, I'm going to zoom out now. Let's see what's going on. This has been going on. See, because my first streams, in, in, the, in the previous streams, it was really meaty. Like, the Ordovician I had a lot to say on, purely because the Ordovician had... The Ordovician, I think, is almost as overlooked as the Silurian is. And as a result, I, I kind of couldn't ignore the Ordovician for major reasons. But the Silurian... The Silurian, for many people, I feel like it's just more of the same. It is the age of fishes. It's considered to be the age of fishes. And if you look at the actual differences in the skeleton, it's not just cartilage versus bone between the chondrichthians and the um, and the osteichthians, but also all the different forms. Like if you have if you have these two different fish diverging at this time, and all the different quests that they took, it it shows that even exposed to the same pressures, the same niche availability, they took completely different routes to get where they are now. That's an enigma as well. So, okay, so, you know, are there multiple ways to skin a cat? Sure. But if this is supposedly a question of survival, then why didn't all fish just have a have an ossified skeleton? Like, well, I mean, why keep why keep cartilage? I mean, obviously, if having an ossified skeleton provided these osteichthians a benefit, shouldn't we also see in the chondrichthians? Vice versa, it's like, you know, if all, all of these agnathans died out, but why didn't they all die out? It's like, are, are lampreys and, and hagfish really the superior uh, agnathans and they just, they just can adapt to a niche that no other animal can fill? I mean, there should be something better than them, right? Or, I mean, maybe there isn't. But we see this time and time again. What makes a shark better than a barracuda? What makes uh, what what made a Dunkleosteus better than a great white shark, or vice versa? What makes a whale better than a whale shark? It doesn't, obviously. But as a question of survival, what helps an organism survive? It's kept so nebulous and so up in the air that we're left just sort of just being like, oh yeah, that makes sense. But we're not thinking about really what's going on in the background. This is, a, this is survival. So nature should tend towards ultimate efficiency pertaining to survival. And even if it finds multiple methods, like why, do, why aren't we seeing these animals exposed to these same pressures, trying to adapt to the same niches? Why aren't we seeing them sort of going in similar directions? We, we, we would assume that, okay, these two pelagic creatures, they should go along similar paths. They are both fish after all, but these are really big questions. The origin of the bony skeleton, the origin of the jaws, all of these things require changes that just, they're hard to pin down on purely survival or fitness benefits. But that's the gist of natural selection. Are you going to say that it's sexual selection? Okay, if it's not if it's not a matter of survival and fitness, then is it a matter of maybe sexual selection? Or are they deliberately choosing to go after the, the fish with the bigger jaw? Is it over for jaw cells? I don't know. But 
as scientists try to explain these away, use big fancy words, all I hear is no evidence, no evidence, no evidence. All I see is that they're, they're explaining things that go against fundamental principles of microevolution. Those being that the more you change your physiology, the more you run the risk of no longer being well adapted to your niche. Are you really going to, you know, change the, the the shape of your gills to work better on land if the shape of your gills or shape of your arms or whatever impacts your way to survive currently? Like, oh, yeah, maybe those tiny fins are really uh, tiny but powerful fins are good for moving through, you know, tight corners underwater. But if they're longer and bigger and, you know, they're getting in the way, like, can you really function well as a fully terrestrial fish while you have these big old legs hanging off you like a tadpole? Who knows? Maybe, yeah. Maybe, yeah. Like, okay, it just make me better adhering to the ground. Maybe I can walk. But it's like, okay, now you have to go from, now you have to make really well-developed lungs and then get rid of your gills uh, at some point, too, and make this transition on the land and change change your skin, change your bone structure, uh, and all of your fundamental skeleton. Um, change. I mean, even something like the land to sea transition, I'll talk about this more in Devonian, the idea of, like, swallowing. <laughs> like, mudskippers have to spit water onto their prey before they swallow it because they don't have tongues. Don't have tongues. So it's like, yeah, I have to develop a tongue from scratch somehow. Um, or at least make a workable one out of the little nubbin I get as a fish or something. But it's more staggering than that. I mean, vascularization in plants alone is such a tough pill to swallow from a natural selection point of view. But to move beyond that, Let's just look comprehensively on the ecosystem level of what sort of happens in the Silurian. So now that that song and dance is out of the way, we can see what generally started to happen. So the world became became basically hotter at the end of the Silurian. And that changed a lot. That caused supposedly algal blooms, and it led to a bit of a die-out before we transitioned um, to the Devonian. And the Devonian's popping. The Devonian is straight up popping. I'm gonna I'm gonna take my time. Uni's about to start for me. I have like two classes left, uh, but the Devonian's gonna be a popping time, and I can't I can't wait to cover it. The Silurian. I think the main reason people do overlook it so much is its is its shortness, like I mentioned earlier. But that's I think the conclusions to be drawn from the order of it, from the uh, Silurian are, are really, are really huge in terms of understanding what happens later on, because these questions are never going to be answered. These questions that are brought up in the Silurian were, will appear again and, and again. It's not just the Silurian. Every time life is going to bounce back from a major extinction event from here on out. And this is, was like the first like major big extinction. I mean, the, the end, uh, the end Cambrian, I guess was a thing. The end Cambrian, but the end Ordovician was like the first big, heavy-duty mass extinction. And seeing that take place and seeing the aftermath of that, this is the first time in history, like, we, life should not have bounced back from the Silurian the way it did. When you lose all but 15% of your biodiversity, you should be crippled, right? But instead, we saw new niches emerging, not just animals radiating into new niches, but new niches actually appearing from scratch in completely alien ecosystems to where they were inhabiting before. And it's, and it's a miracle. It's absolutely miraculous how that happened. And it's not explainable by natural selection and, and increases in fitness. It can't be. It's just too drastic. It's too quick and it's too dramatic and too seamless for it to be any other way. I don't see it. And if somebody wants to send me a, a letter or, or want to, I guess shit post in the comments about it. Be my guest. But unless you can conjure up Nobel Prize worthy material justifying and explaining how these new niches can appear out of thin air and how these animals can radiate into them in such short amounts of time, then then feel free. I I honestly welcome any any challenge or open debate to the things I say here, but I wouldn't be here saying it live if anything that I was saying that was saying now is unsubstantiated. There's nothing that I'm saying about this, about the Silurian or Ordovician or any period in history. I will correct myself, but very few of what I'm saying at the meat of both of things is untrue because this is the current status quo. We're living currently in a society where scientists use their ethos, use the letters after their names, use their 
you know, big bad credentials or the fact that I'm published in the journal Nature to to shill their new age religion. Because what is this? What is evolution? What is macroevolution if not a justification for abiogenesis? The reason that I started this off with abiogenesis was because I knew this connection already. It's not like during the course of this this series of streams, I've suddenly conjured this up and made this connection out of the blue and blitzed me like lightning. The same radiation that we see here, oh, it's explained away in hand with the same way that we saw radiation in the Cambrian, where every single body format that we'll ever see ever uh, appeared out of thin air from organisms that were no more complex than jellyfish. And now we're being told the same thing after a massive apocalypse on a, on a planetary scale, we now see life is more diverse than ever. And that's just hand waved away because of animals wanting to survive, of traits being selected by reproduction. It's a tough, it's a, it's a tough sell. And the hubris of modern scientists to say this is, it's honestly flabbergasting. I mean, the absolute balls to sit there and call yourself a scientist and yet espouse that we know exactly what's going on here. And, oh, it's all down to things you can read in any evolutionary textbook or something. It's just the fact that this is required in school. In fact, ironically, one of the last classes I need is evolution. And although I'm going to be happy to take this class and get my credits and fuck off forever, um, yeah, not going to be not going to be point out. Let me see. Yeah, aliens and globia, the the plant, the panspermia hypothesis. Per, per, panspermia is definitely uh, one of the whack job ones out there. Doing pretty great, Emmanuel. So to explain the uh, this take, like what does globalism have to do with evolution? What could possibly be the agenda behind evolution? So let's take it back. All evolutionary science does go back to abiogenesis, as I've said multiple times now, but it doesn't take a, a mass dedication of brain power. It doesn't take a think tank. It doesn't take some, some jackass sitting on the television and, and speaking about this for, for it to be obvious. They just want to dismantle traditional religion. Let's be clear. And I actually didn't smoke at all this stream. I feel like I feel like I've committed some sort of transgression, but I got to take a smoke for this. But the globalist, what does the globalist have to gain from evolution? Well, we all come from one source, don't you know? If we can dismantle the ideas that human beings are somehow distinct from animals, that the things that make us unique as humans are fabrications of our own sapient hubris, then wouldn't it be much easier to justify the treatment of human beings as animals? Suddenly, something like eugenics, I guess abortion, whatever, doesn't sound as bad, because aren't we just animals after all? If we dehumanize ourselves by just saying that we come from apes or we come from fish or come from pond scum, then, oh, being a human isn't that special. Your life isn't more important than some silverback gorilla in the Congo. You're just an invasive species. What they want to do is they want to put human beings in purely biological terms and effectively dehumanize us by essentially stating you're no different than an animal. We all derive from a single cell. And there is no God, there is no higher power, there is no intelligent design, there's nothing that exists but what we say happened. They want to monopolize the truth because they can't stand the fact that there is any academic or wider societal pushback to their way of thinking. They are no different than any other cultists that have gotten power at any point in history. They abhor anybody that goes against them and they label them as unscientific and ignorant and unknowing of the truth. But there are fundamental problems with your theory. And it does not take hours of shit posting and researching and articles like, can I see a source? I'm like, okay, you need to see a source for how the ribosome can create itself? Like my first, very first stream on abiogenesis basically painted open everything that would be wrong with evolution from then on out. See, it's not just one thing about evolution that stinks. 
it's the entire premise outside of what Darwin originally observed through microevolution in the Galapagos. Literally everything else built around that is a giant caked on layer of bullshit around actual science, a kernel of actual science in a massive fucking turd of new age materialist religion. And I'm sick of people acting like it's, it's just, oh, this is just, no, this is a scientific way of thinking. Like bullshit. Bull fucking shit. How is there anything objective about thinking that everything came from nothing? Because I guarantee the same person who believes in abiogenesis, the same person who believes in Big Bang, the same person who thinks that God's a fairy tale. You cannot say that every vociferous atheist on this planet is an evolutionist and then say that it's not some form of religion. The atheist is not an atheist. His God is randomness. His God is chaos. Because I guarantee this motherfucker believes in both Big Bang and evolution as alternatives to the creation of God. If you were a true atheist, you wouldn't even believe in creation. You'd say, alien, oh, aliens dropped us off or that we've always, always been here. You wouldn't even believe in any sort of higher power. But their higher power, the thing that they worship, is the god of randomness. The god of pure fucking dice-throwing chaos that created this entire universe from nothing. Life came from nothing, despite Louis Pasteur proving that it doesn't. Louis Pasteur's experiments prove all life has a bio biological origin. You can't get life from not life. All life begets life. That's bullshit because it doesn't work for my religion. And then the Big Bang, it's like, well, you know, we don't have any ability to protect the weather two, two weeks in advance. We don't know um, anything about uh, history that isn't written down. But I can definitely tell you what happened uh, at the beginning of the universe. Because I know math. A discipline that we've only been genuinely actually perfecting in a serious academic way for 600 years at the most. But trust me, bro. Trust me, bro. My, my numbers make the most sense. My numbers can tell us everything about the universe instead of what the weather is going to be two weeks from now. That's what we're dealing with, bro. Like, that's what glo globalists want to tell you that, you know, your kids are raping the environment, that everyone that you love is going to die of starvation. And if... If you want to pull up every prediction that these motherfuckers have made over the last century that's gone wrong, then, yeah. Yeah, and 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 that's kind of the crucial thing. It's like, oh, the Catholic Church, the Catholic Church, the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church never tried to bullshit who they were to people. They're the Catholic Church. They show up in robes. They show up and we're the Catholic Church. They've never tried to say that we're not a religious organization. They've never tried to say that we're not a church, that we're not like exactly who we say we are. But scientists do. Scientists want to sit there. And I mean, scientists like with with quotations, especially those who are all buddy buddy with the climatologists and the World Economic Forum and the G7 summit and all of these other bureaucratic oligarch gatherings. What we see are these people who sit there like, I'm a scientist, I have a PhD, I'll tell you all of these really cool facts about nature. And they'll tell you like, oh, otters have like 15,000 hairs every square inch. They'll show you these cute little graphics on YouTube. And then they'll be like, isn't it mind blowing how evolution works, how how Pachycetus can become something like Dorodon and just a scan 15 million years at the most. That in just a, a small blink of the eye, we could go from something so mundane and terrestrial to something so beautiful and aquatic. Oh, what poppycock it is to ever go against this. And they act, it's just, they beg the question. If you look up the technical definition of begging the question, it's making an argument assuming that your premise is correct. And every single scientist I've ever talked to, I'm like, dude, you're begging the question by assuming that your premise of macroevolution is 100% correct. And it's not. It's not. You want to cherry pick the fossil record? You're like, well, this animal looks like this animal. And this animal looks like this animal. They all came before. I'm like, that's cool. That's nice. That doesn't prove descent. And also, furthermore, we don't even know if these are actually different animals or variations of the same creature or anything. Because all we have are mineralized fossils. We don't have DNA. We don't have biochemical analysis. And we know that using comparative uh, comparative anatomy on modern creatures will lead you to a lot of problems. If you use comparative anatomy on a Clarks and a Western Greb, Clarks and Western Greb are considered different species. They don't interbreed. They look different. But if you look just at their skeletons, good luck trying to tell the difference. Their species, like if we have a fossilized Chihuahua and a fossilized Great Dane, like I brought up earlier, future scientists would totally say those are different species. 100%. If you only found a thylacine's lower jawbone, 
and you didn't have the upper jaw with the two little dimples that showed it was a marsupial, or if you had a partial skull of a thylacine next to like a red fox, you'd say it's a canid. Like, oh, we well, only have the lower jaw and we have a portion of the front jaw. It's a canid. They do that shit all the fucking time in the fossil record. Like, um, like the Bone Wars. Big, big legendary uh, thing in paleontology. Um, like all of these new dinosaurs being named and half of them were bullshit. Half of them were juvenile forms of creatures that currently existed. They did that with like almost every juvenile dinosaur that you could possibly think of. Even like uh, synapsids, like um, Antiosaurus, like juvenile Antiosaurus were seen in the Permian were seen as different creatures. And I'll bring up uh, Antiosaurus and, and the Permian animals in, in that one. But the globalist, if they can say that you're not a person, you don't have a soul, everything comes from nothing. What does religion provide? What did the Catholic Church provide? Paradise. It, it said that human beings are distinct from animals. We have souls. We have a unique sapiens and sentience that tells us apart. But that's what's going on here. They want to remove your soul. They want to rip out your soul like some stereotypical Disney villain. They, they want to rip out your soul and replace it with a philosophy of nothingness and nihilism. They want to say, you came from pond scum, you pond scum sucking piece of shit. You're going to live in the pod. You're going to eat the bugs and you'll own nothing and you'll be happy. And then Klaus Schwab will come in dressed like a fucking Star Trek villain and proclaim to the world that the great race set will be upon us. And all, all these, all these NPCs and normies will clap because yeah, bro, I fucking came from monkeys, bro. What does it mean? But it's like, these people have no purpose. They have, it's like every scientist I've met. And this is take it from this. This is no longer just about the subject matter. This is personal. Now, every single one of these cunts that I've met have all been cripplingly depressed and anxious. They all have massive insecurity concerning where they want to be in life. And they realize, oh man, I'm all uppity and shit as a PhD, but if I'm not kissing ass, if I'm not browning, if I'm not um, kissing up to people uh, in my discipline, I'm getting nowhere in my career. You will get nowhere in your career if you are not an ass kisser. If you want to stand on your own two feet and make a name for yourself, that's on you. You're left to the dogs. You're not even associated with academia. Like, uh, like this one guy on YouTube said, if you deny evolution, these people aren't your peers. And I guess you're not, I guess that's true. I guess they're my enemies because right now, uh, Emmanuel said something about, uh, the crusades. It, this is literally a jihad against established Abrahamic religion. And the funniest part in places where you would think that the war would be getting won the best. And this is the funniest thing about evolution. It falls apart under scrutiny. It falls apart under scrutiny. Like many controversial propagandized events looking at were you world war two, there's a lot of things that happened there that when applied to scrutiny, do not actually pan out in reality. Wow, turns out, when I actually look at this in depth, it doesn't make any fucking sense. It's almost as if it's tied up in this beautiful bow and presented to us, but the actual objective information there, the actual calculus, does not equal zero. You know, you're, you're actually plugging in those maths. You're, you're looking at the, you know, zero factorial, and if it's not, if it's not adding up to one, bro, then you fucked up the zero factorial. You didn't do it right. You're doing your factorials. If it eight factorial zero and you're not getting one, you, you fucked up. So like, where are we at? Like, where are we at in science where anybody who just points out obvious shit is seen as a pariah? I can't say this. If I came up to my class or if I went to a classroom and I said, modern evolution is a crock of shit uh, because natural selection actually does not incentivize creatures to leave their niches that massive physiological change cannot be um determined just by random changes to the genome over um indeterminate amounts of time and that the time scales for these changes and changes in behavior and changes uh in physiology and genetics don't match up uh, to what we're seeing it's just like when you say this kind of stuff it's just like instantly they just get triggered it's like this normie program runs in their brains and they're just like well, there's all this fossil data showing that these animals are so closely related and that there's the, there were these in different times and they're more basal. And I'm like, well, for every one of those examples, there's a ghost lineage that shows animals that, oh, suddenly they're here in the fossil record, even though there's no fossil evidence for them before. 
for every one of those groundbreaking examples, there's a living fossil. There, for every, for every, uh, for every pachycetus, there's a horseshoe crab. I mean, even looking at how long birds have been, birds have been around since the mid Jurassic, late Jurassic. If you want to look at birds that look kind of like birds today, but uh, this idea that birds came from velociraptors is pretty cool a concept. And I'll even say birds are dinosaurs, but even looking at the dinosaur to bird transition, I'm like, well, there's a lot of changes in physiology here. And the same time you ha have like something like an Archaeopteryx, I'm like there's still too many changes here to say that they're birds. And it turns out because birds are so tiny and delicate, just like with pterosaurs, they're incredibly hard to fossilize. So you can't even say that Archaeopteryx is the first bird. Who the hell knows how early birds actually go back? And we see this a lot. We see animals that we think go back a certain amount of time, and then they're not there. And ever since the coelacanth suddenly came back, the coelacanth didn't even make it to the KPG mass extinction event, supposed to die out about 70 million years ago. Suddenly they're found not only off the coast of South Africa, but also in the Indian Ocean and you know, off, off of the Malay archipelago and shit. Like, let's be real here. Scientists don't know what the fuck they're talking about 99% of the time. And if the pandemic has taught us anything is to not trust the quote unquote experts, but also look into the fact that do they have an agenda? What's their investments? Who's their boss? Where are they getting paid? Because again, academics are ass kissers because every single academic has to kiss ass to get where they are. Every tenured professor was a professional ass kisser from his undergrad all the way to his PhD dissertation defense. He was kissing ass the whole fucking time. There's nobody with a spine in academia. Not a single fucking person, not a single one of them will use their brain to stand up against the status quo. Yeah. Or the way we could solve problems with different solutions. Yeah, freedom of speech. What they're trying to what they're trying to do too um, in this direction. It isn't just freedom of speech. Remember, this is their ethos. Their ethos is that we are the educated. We are the book people. We are the ones that are smart. If you don't agree with us and you're a fucking idiot who doesn't know shit, that's what they're trying to control. They're not trying to overtly say, you can't say this. It's just that if you do say this, oh, you're a Bible thumper. You're a, you're a denier. And it's so funny because being a climate denier or being a evolution denier, is used like a slur, like a homophobe or something. And it makes me laugh because if, you're, if your ideology is so watertight, then why are you so frightened of criticism? Why are you so afraid of criticism if this is just locked down? If the science is settled, why are you so painfully terrified of people speaking out against it? You should see how they recoil when you talk shit on evolution. And you could, and it's just... I, like, I would just point out the most basic stuff. Like, part of what made me snap, I would point out the most basic stuff. I'm like, I don't see how natural selection, like I've said before, I don't see how natural selection is anything special compared to sexual selection. Sexual selection is a conscious choice by animals to select traits that are not actually helping the animal survive. It's like, oh, well, having long tail feathers of the peacock proves that they could survive despite the disadvantage. I'm like, that's retarded. Because animal survival is not a matter of, ha-ha, it's a game, it's numbers in a computer. It's, I will literally get my ass eaten if I do not get away from this predator. I will fucking die. No animal is going to, like, what animal species is going to be like, oh, well, I guess we're going to die more, but at least we look hot. That's not natural selection. And sexual selection has been a thorn in the side of evolutionists for, for years. And every single scientist that points out, Hey, well, sexual selection proves that it's not all just a matter of fitness and survival, that that actual changes in animals can be driven by conscious decision. Huh. But those conscious decisions are still, you know, not affecting feeding behavior that much. They're not affecting the, the most fundamental aspects. It's not changes that affect the ability for the animals to copulate. But there are display structures, different colors. And, and birds can get away with it because they can fly. But, I mean, we see this everywhere. Like, why do, uh, why do deer have to invest all this calcium and phosphorus and vitamins into making these big ass antlers that they're just going to shed is to compete with others of their species. I mean, they're, those horns aren't really good for deterring predators. If they wanted to deter, deter predators, they would probably invest, I don't know, more ability into, into kicking or um, get, getting sharper teeth like tusk deer. But 
I mean, antlers, they're just to wrestle with other members of the species. That's all due to sexual selection. There's nothing about survival involved with that. It's about reproduction. Okay, the goal is reproductive. But what helps you reproduce more? Staying within your niche and trying to fight for that niche against anything that tries to invade it or take you over there or whatever environmental pressures or trying to go into a completely new niche, pioneering yourself into a new niche completely by yourself and then expecting that you're just going to be able to, it's like all the behaviors, all the changes, and it all happens in less than 10 million years with many of these species. And we're supposed to just roll with those punches, but that's not what they're trying to go after. The free speech thing. It, it's, it's, it's very sly because it isn't just, Oh, we're going to restrict your freedom of speech regarding this. Like, of course there's the demonization. They don't want you praying at schools, for example, they don't want the bias. They'll mandate education be taught, but then say kids are being indoctrinated by being taught religion, which, okay. But it's just their, their, their refusal to engage with anybody on this subject that doesn't agree with a, with a certain amount of what's being said already. If you critique the very mechanism of evolution, um, they won't even talk with you. They'll be like, oh, uh, you're, you don't even understand what evolution is. I'm like, then you explain it. Explain to me how animals can radically change their physiology through random changes in the genome being selected by natural or sexual selection. Explain to me how this, this animal can radically alter everything about itself uh, to exploit a niche it doesn't even know to exploit. And when you say this kind of stuff to them, it's like, oh, well, you're not even framing the question correctly. I'm like, no, really explain to me how genes can come out of nowhere, despite being literally astronomically impossible. New genes do not sprout out of nowhere. Every, every mutation we see is alterations to pre-existing proteins. That's definitive. And new any new pr proteins that we do see appear are almost overwhelmingly negative. That's like prionic disease is an example of that. Um, transmissible spongiform encephalopathies, long ass word, but that's fucking prionic activity. You want to talk about new proteins being made? Want to talk about mutations? That's what you get. You get prionic diseases. You don't get fucking fish that grow lungs or fish that grow jaws, like what we see in the Silurian, for example. But it's a new way. It's a religion. Anybody who acts like evolutionism isn't a religion is kind of deluded. Yeah. And I, I appreciate it, bro. If you ever have any specific questions on what I say, uh, feel free to drop uh, any comment. Um, even though these aren't my chop ups, uh, the format still remains. So despite it not being a chop up, the chop up really, it's like me and Poppy. Poppy actually um, got a got into an altercation. I'll probably have a chop up with him this weekend too. Hopefully if he's, if he's filling up for it uh, to, to go over that, but it's a little bit of spicy drama on that end. Uh, but yeah, even though this isn't my chop up and I'll be mostly going full screen sometimes just to go on my rants and not interact as much, still feel free to drop questions. If you ever want to um, ask me anything or go over something again, or don't, don't feel free. This isn't really a lecture. It's mostly just a rant following a specific topic and timeline. But yeah, so here, um, yeah, sexual competition with men trying to one-up each other with resources and sexual attraction, but there's a conscious decision to get with that person. Yeah, and not only that, but in the example I was trying to provide earlier, there's also certain things about sexual selection that make no sense from a survival perspective or, or are deleterious to survival in other ways, showing that fitness isn't about like being physically fit, it's about reproducing, whatever. But it seems like, the conscious choice of females and males, it's its because it's both sexes, uh, a male, the, the, the idea that ma males will only compete for females who are fertile and they'll only compete for females that they that they find is high, high, highly uh, attractive, for example, like a female also has to look decent An old, not reproducing female or female that's obviously sick. The males aren't going to bother uh, trying to compete for that female. In fact, they'll drive them off like what you'd see with like elk or, or other, other ruminants will drive off females that aren't fertile in their herd. Um, but sexual competition with men trying to one up each other, you could, one could say like, oh yeah, I can see how trying to be a bigger, tougher man with harder knuckles, whatever would help you. Uh, but there's also other aspects of being a man or things that are selected for in men, like neotenous features, neoteny. Like it shows that humans in sexual selection prefer neotenous features, Re the reduced brow ridges, the more uh, adolescent features, less robust skeletons, less 
hefty jaw bones and less protruding jaws and everything and just getting a more gray style skeleton seeming that seemingly was a trend between the early humans and now like the anatomically modern humans have been around for 300,000 years and even during the homo heidelberg bergensis eras of like 600,000 years ago we went through magical wand wave transformation to modern humans and then just stopped changing except into different races i guess but the the wand of evolution stopped the buck stopped at homo sapiens for some reason we haven't uh, become different species um but you know whatever well what we have seen is that we've become more gracile how does that help us survive oh maybe it helps us run more da, 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 da. but when males are directly competitive how does being gracile help you when you're getting punched in the face we know that older human skeletons are much more resilient towards shock damage that a neanderthal is much more capable of taking a hit than a homo sapien but we still see human beings gain like human males uh good musculature for punching, still have, have strong knuckles and wrists compared to women. We still have strong orbits uh, that, that help us absorb blows. So the neoteny has gone so far, but why would we select neoteny? Because men simultaneously are selecting for neotenous women. The, the men who are competing are competing for women who are neotenous. They have children that then also express more neotenous traits, but that competition is still there between men. There's a paradox of sexual selection that flies in the face of this efficiency hypothesis that exists in natural selection, that only the traits that the only traits that are positive selected are those that will aid in survival. But becoming more neotenous has only made us more susceptible to injury when getting into fistfights. Neanderthals back in the day would have to get hit by a car to get injured by something to the same extent a human being can get injured in a fistfight. Like we fall on the ground and hit our head and die in a fistfight. I hardly, I hardly believe that a homo heidelbergensis or a, even an early human would, would be able to justify that. But yeah. And again, this is the big thing, Emmanuel, the big thing, how much of these rules apply to us and how much are we beyond them? Because again, the main goal, look at the objective. The goal is to dehumanize us and may just convert us into animal terms to just places in the same framework of natural and sexual selection that other, every other animal is beholden to and to act like our conscious will is relevant. And that's why sexual selection is such a difficult topic because, again, like you brought up, you know, we don't know if they have a sense of consciousness or not. Like awareness of the environment is one thing, but the idea that you make a conscious decision to select a mate It's difficult because we see this even in brine shrimp. Even brine shrimp will have a mounting position that's called station taking. So what you get with brine shrimp, these are like fucking sea monkeys, literally sea monkeys, brine shrimp. And they'll do something called station taking. And the males will take up a station next to the females. So you'll have like the females swimming along. The male will swim because they swim like uh, most of swim upside down, whatever. But the male will station take to where the gonopore is like he'll try to inseminate the female uh, using modified uh, using modified limbs, and she has an egg sac back here. But sometimes the males don't do it, and they don't know why. Like sometimes the, the males will actually be kind of picky about which female they actually decide to commit to, and scientists don't know why this happens. So if consciousness is a matter of choosing a mate, if choosing a mate is the fundamental. Uh, litmus test on consciousness then it can very much be argued that even creatures as simple as brine shrimp are conscious if, if mate selection is a litmus test for consciousness if, if, that, if that isn't a form of consciousness it can, it can be difficult but consciousness is not sapience like sentience isn't sapience sapience is higher intelligence like what we have but sentience or consciousness is just the ability of one to be aware of its environment and others in its environment so the, the mirror test, this is one thing I really disagree with, the mirror test. You could give a mirror to a caveman and he'd think that shit is pure fucking witchcraft. He'd think that shit is magic. He would not know what to make of it. Perfectly intelligent human being, and I don't even think he'd pass a mirror test. Like, if you put a red dot on him, it's, I mean, he's probably going to think that he's looking to a portal into another world that he got his soul stolen. If peasants can think that mirrors steal their souls, am I really supposed to sit here and say that whales aren't conscious because it didn't recognize itself in a mirror or something? It's like, come on. But 
again, this is all an attempt because animals deserve more credit, but they shouldn't be anthropomorphized. Consciousness is not sapiens. The thing that makes us different is that we have parts of our brain that amplify sensation. So we feel pain, we feel tragedy, we feel emotions on a deeper level than other animals do, if you count us as animals. A shark may register a nerve response associated with pain, but it doesn't have the processing of capability to properly register that on a human scale. And this is where people confuse intelligence. I think intelligence is the ability to do math or some shit. What animals really lack is the brain processing power. A human experiences suffering, experiences joy, experiences guilt, and all these fundamental emotions in such, in, at such scales that other animals just cannot fucking compare. And the only animals that can are whales, like orcas, that have especially built up uh, areas of their brain associated with social and emotional behavior. But human beings, our brains are so fucking supercharged and so beyond what animals have, you can't say the suffering of a cow, even if it's beat to shit and abused its whole life. The relative suffering is not anywhere near the same as like a human being placed in that same scenario. A human being being locked in a crate uh, is nowhere near like a bear being locked in a crate for its bile. Is it fucked up and horrendous? Of course, and the people who do that should be shot. But is the bear suffering at the same magnitude as a human suffering? No. And that's what makes it tragic. Human is a sapient creature. It can use reasoning and logic to perceive injustice. Animals cannot. It can, it can, it, we have the brain power and the processing ability to feel emotion in such poignant and extreme ways to the point where we can even feel emotions of other people, like empathy and sympathy, where animals oftentimes do not. And even though we might see altruism in nature, we might see cooperative behavior in nature, we might see animals forming bonds and befriending and imprinting on one another. All of these are superficial facsimiles of what we see in human beings. Human beings are genuinely on a scale that we can barely fathom. The brain being the most complex system, complex structure in the universe is not an exaggeration. And the human brain is fascinating in its capacity and capabilities. But that is so overlooked by these people who just want to make us deriv derive from animals. Like we're all just animals. There's nothing special to humans. We're just animals like everything too. But it's not true. We are by far and away the most superior life form this planet has ever produced. And that's not an exaggeration. I don't give a fuck about the Tyrannosaurus Rex or the Megalodon. You could bring out some giant ass Argentinosaurus and I'm like, cool, but we're still better because our brain gives us the ability to do things that none of these, I mean, how badass is an Argentinosaurus versus the Empire State Building or the Apollo 18 mission? I mean, give me a fucking break. No, no creature on this planet could ever compare to us. So, but that's not what they want to do. What they want to do is they, they want to basically treat us like cattle. Like, oh, we're such animals that we could be treated like cattle. And the first step is to rip out the soul of everybody that you can. Every single person that falls for evolution is a hollow husk of a human being. And academia is filled with people that are terrified of the implications that maybe their cult of materialism is wrong. That maybe they're is something more to life. Maybe there is an intelligent creator. Maybe there is some unseen force. Maybe we are being shepherded by aliens, but they don't want to believe that anything but random chaos created the universe because they cannot stand the implication that they aren't the greatest thing in the universe. Human beings may be the greatest thing on earth, but are we the greatest thing in the cosmos? And that's an uncomfortable question for these scientists to ask. They don't want to admit or believe that any sort of higher or intelligent power is guiding life, even though DNA is as close to biological binary as you can possibly fucking get. It is one of the most efficient and straightforward ways to store any sort of information. And I don't believe that you can even get DNA with that intelligent design. It's very structure feels like it's intelligently designed. The entire apparatus of life is so mind blowingly complex. That the idea that it comes, comes about randomly or that changes to it happen randomly feels so fucking out of left field. I, I feel like it's so much crazier to postulate that random changes are, are responsible for the current biodiversity we see in the world than any than even like the fucking Anunnaki coming down and creating life in bio laboratories. I believe that uh, that alien seeded this planet long before I'd ever believe that random shit, uh, random fucking lightning strikes and shit created all life on the planet. And that radiation events are down to, oh, there's suddenly fucking grass on land now. I guess I'll turn from a fucking crab into a to an insect it's like that kind of shit man just loses me
And I know that I'm oversimplifying it and kind of satirizing it, but it's the truth. I, I just, I don't have any more time for this shit. And once I leave academia, I'm leaving it forever. Once I'm done, I'm done. And I'm not, I'm just going to be a naturalist. I'm going to go out in the bush. I'm going to collect data for people, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to entangle myself in academia. Um, and I'm just making that as a conscious decision. Will that close doors for me? Probably. But I'm not going to live my life being a, being a ass kisser under fluorescent lights. Um, just so one day, maybe in my 40s or 50s, I can become a tenured professor at some mid-level university. It's like, there's no point, dude. If you want to spend your life um, actually doing something worthwhile, then don't go into academia off any subject. Um Yeah, getting close to the Imperium of Man. Yeah, and then the, another previous consciousness, our uh, consciousness, uh, sapience distinction. Yeah, so awareness. What does it mean to be aware? I'm gonna I'm gonna dive deep on onto this one, um, or at least a little deeper. So consciousness and sapience. What does it mean to be sapient in in a specific capacity? It's the ability to use reason. That's all it is. You know, people want to make a bunch of high convoluted arguments about this shit. Can you use reason? Can you uh, modus ponens um, A plus B, therefore C? Can you draw correlation? Uh, many animals can, can have basic reasoning faculties. They can observe patterns of behavior. But reasoning goes deeper. Again, in a human capacity, sapience is a determination of an animal's cognition, but also its overall scale and level of awareness humans conveniently are the benchmark for sapiens you are not sapient if you're not at a human level of intelligence we created this benchmark because we know that the gulf between human and animal is vast even the most intelligent orca on this planet does not does not touch a human's reasoning capacity or faculties okay can an orca figure out like oh if if i swim towards iceberg and dive under iceberg wave knockoff seal yes very intelligent sure but does the orca have the reasoning capacity to understand nuances in future events does an orca understand delayed gratification does an orca understand the concepts of responsibility does it understand the con the, the concept of true genuine altruism does it understand concepts that pertain to um things beyond it nature uh, the unknown, or can it can it actually reasonably, using reasoning faculties, figure out problems that it may not confront yet? But sapience and consciousness, although intertwined, the biggest distinction between them comes down to a matter of awareness versus cognition. If you're aware of something, that's consciousness. It's a simply a matter of are you awake? Is, is this microbe swimming through the pond actually aware of anything? Single-celled organisms can take cues from outside their environment. Is taking and reacting to chemical or light stimuli a form of consciousness? Technically, yes. It's just awareness. But consciousness of consequence, consciousness of origin, consequence of ultimate implication is a matter of sapience. Does a mouse know when I pick up this pencil that I'm about to break its neck and feed it to a raptor? No, it doesn't. It, it, it doesn't even put two and two together. Like if it associates guns with violence, sure, because it requires association. But it, but an animal is not conscious enough at the same level as a human being to reach sapiens. It can't use reasoning at the level that a human can. It cannot use reasoning at a level that even a dumb human can, even the retarded can. It, it has to it has to rely on base instinct and learn patterns and there's a limit to it a dog can only learn so many commands there's a hard ceiling on animal intelligence and understanding the difference between sapience and consciousness can save a lot of questions because many people will confuse the two just to trip you up they will try to claim that every animal is conscious therefore every animal has a soul and every animal should be anthropomorphized to a certain extent but they always ignore the sapience argument that sapience is not applicable to any animal but us, if we are even animals. But, yeah, and the lukewarm Christian. So, I'm going to get into this one. 
because it, it deserves to be gotten into. I'll, I'll even switch to the jellyfish cam. The idea of the lukewarm Christian, I'm even going to smoke my pipe to this one, because it's something I can't fucking stand. So let's be real here. So Christianity is based in red pill, but modern Christians don't even read the Bible. You know, they don't even look at the life of Christ. They don't look at any historical event in any capacity. Marcus Aurelius's meditations, people forget that, oh, there's a philosopher Roman emperor. And he taught us things like, don't be a slave to your emotion. You know, taught us general wisdom. So people might accept that. But the Bible, it says a lot of things about a lot of things. A lot of things that people don't want to hear. And as a result, even though Christianity has a very positive, very overwhelmingly positive message, it's created a lot of enemies because the people that adhere to Christianity adhere to tradition. Anybody who wants to break down anything traditional, any traditional structures has to go through the religion of, of, that, of that place. In the West, it's Christianity. Um, after the seventh century, it was it was Islam in North Africa, uh, much of the Malay Archipelago, Southeast Asia, India, and then you had Buddhism. And the dominant religion of an area, they can coexist with other religions. But this is remember, evolutionism is a new era religion. It's it's a it's a cult materialism based and predicated upon uh, the findings of Charles Darwin. That is not compatible. And if the reason and if people want to say that atheism isn't a religion. Like, if it's not a religion, then why are you trying to displace Christianity like you are a religion? Why are you acting like, why are you doing what Islam did to Christianity or what Buddhism is doing to Islam in, in uh, Myanmar with the Rohingya, whatever? I have my own takes on those that aren't what you think. But if you look at where two religions overlap, eventually one religion will try to oust the other religion. And lukewarm Christians, in all of their cucked spineless fervor have vociferously defended people who want to see them destroyed they they want to let like the church like the lutheran church of sweden letting that lesbian pastor try to proclaim that oh we should get rid of crosses um in swedish churches to make it more inclusive to muslims or we see like you know methodists talking about gender transitioning and how to advise your partitioners or we see, it's like, if you're going to adhere to a book and you're going to say that, oh, well, passages in such and such area of the Bible don't matter. I'm like, yeah, we're all saved through grace, whatever. But just because a verse is inconvenient, just because Jesus has inconvenient things to say about your lifestyle or about your sexual orientation or about the way you decide to get down in your life. Nobody cares what you think. This is either sinful or non-sinful behavior, and your opinion on the matter is irrelevant. You choosing not to adhere to the religion doesn't matter. If you decide to steal, and you don't think there's anything bad about that because, well, I'm not a Christian. I don't adhere to the Ten Commandments. Well, then guess what? You're probably still going to get your hand chopped off because guess what? Most societies, they converge on these principles because they make sense. Traditions are just solutions to problems that we now take for granted and the problems caused by stripping tradition is is seen to unfold like the christian church in the west is not dying in fact christianity as a global religion is still outpacing islam by a fair clip especially since more and more people in like asia and china and korea and even japan are becoming more and more christianized not to mention africa and a lot of latin america still christianizing from uh, traditional religions but this cult of evolution that a lot of people are pushing is meant specifically to displace Christians, so to disillusion Christians, to give them an alternative to what they believe in Genesis by saying that the, in, the evidence is overwhelming. You have no evidence for uh, what happened uh, in Genesis, whereas we have heaps and scads of evidence for what we think and believe. Except they don't. But again... It's all, it's all the argument for the argument's sake. They'll say these things and not be able to back them. They'll distract you with a bunch of information from an irrelevant 
or very cherry picked aspect of the fossil record or of the scientific literature, but then conveniently ignore um, the meat and bones of what's really going on. Like, again, like I pointed out with abiogenesis, the ribosome, like, oh yeah, everything makes so much sense. And if you don't think about where the ribosome came from, you know, just the thing that creates all the proteins in the body, like, yeah, that just came out of scratch from nowhere, even though there's two components of the ribosome and three different forms of RNA that are necessary, including DNA to actually create proteins in the cell. Yeah, no, uh, that just came out of, that just appeared out of scratch from other uh, component RNA. So you needed five different types of RNA, two different types of RNA uh, to create the actual constituency of the RNA. Then for the tRNA and the mRNA, um, yeah, that has to, that also has to come from the nucleus or from surrounding material. That's how the amino acids kind of get there. But it's, it's just funny to me. It's funny that you need three to four different types of a, of a single type of RNA. And it seems simple, right? Oh, it's RNA. It could just pretzel itself in these new shapes out of nowhere. But again, irreductible complexity makes it to where we need all those things to appear at once. So they might say, oh, life makes so much sense. We all come from a common origin, but it's all underhanded. It's all just like snake oil, you know, sweep you out from under the rug and lukewarm Christians all, they don't want to understand their enemy. They take all this at face value, like, oh, well, I'll believe in evolution as a Christian. I think they're compatible. And no one likes a fence sitter. No one likes somebody who isn't strong in their convictions. You either find the flaws in this shit, which exist. I'm not the first, nor will I be the last person to talk about evolution in a critical manner, or at least the current take on evolution in, in, a, in a critical manner. But there are many Christians and many religious people out there, Christians especially, who who've condoned this. And have let the evolutionist message become ubiquitous in their society. I don't see many Muslim or Buddhist societies letting evolution run rampant like this. But every Christian church will talk about evolution now. As if it's definitively a thing. Instead of sticking to their guns and going by the book, literally just go by the book. They now want to entertain all of these secular notions that are meant specifically to counter them. So the Catholic Church embracing evolution and... All of this stuff about like inclusivity, inclusivity. It's something that really just pisses me off. And I see how a lot of people, it's just like the actions of lukewarm Christians, I think lose more Christians than the actions of the actual atheists and evolutionists. I, I feel like just by being a lukewarm, pussified, non-convicted idiot, you're driving more people away from your church as a pastor or preacher than anything that these scientists say or do. If you're strong and you're convicted and you're, you know what you're saying is the truth, or you at least believe in what you're saying is the truth, it doesn't matter what people say. You could be preaching about the fucking flying spaghetti monster, and you'll probably still have more people listening to you than some random, you know, what they call Christ cucks. I, I don't know if I really like that term, but it makes sense for these people. It's just like no one no one respects you, man. Like, unless if you don't stick to your guns, if you don't make strong stances, even if others may perceive them as wrong or illegitimate or dumb, it's like, remember... Uh, whenever the, you think the world's going against you, it went after me first. Jesus said that himself. Whenever you think the world is going against you, whenever you think the world hates you, it hated me first. So if you want to bend the knee to a bunch of these vociferous academic types and you know all these people on YouTube and Reddit that want to act like, oh, well, I'm enlightened on my own intelligence because I'm an atheist and God is a bunch of fairy tales, I'm like, cool. But if you're going to be a Christian, you need to stop acting like a, a, a beta secular wimp that just won't stand up for themselves. Admit that you're a Christian. If you're, if someone's doing something uncomfortable because of your religion, every Muslim in America will stand up for that. But Christians will just sit there and take it. They, they sit there and take discipline. I mean, if people, if Christians are out beheading priests and, and shooting up cartoonists like, like Muslims do, there would be no shitting on Christians. There would be no... Uh, you know, no ha ha comedians like uh, like what's his face, the uh, Ricky Gervais staying up there making Christian God jokes. They know Christians are passive and we've done this to ourselves. If, if Christians want to stop being passive, then go for it. So I don't I'm religious myself. But as as far as like these people, I'm, I'm most of them are just people who aren't even really Christians themselves. If you're going to be Christian, be Christian. If I if, if I as a religious person make religion about everything and I don't use science, that's one thing. But if I, as a religious person, just want to have my own beliefs and 
from my beliefs, poke holes and theories that try to attack my beliefs, then that's what I'm doing. If as a Christian, I'm not doing this because I'm trying to prove Christianity right. I'm just trying to point out the fact that this cult is trying to LARP their religion as science, as objective science. So people always want to do that. They were like, oh, you're a Christian. That's why you're doing this kind of stuff. And that's not true. I'm, I'm doing this because if you're going to attack my faith, if you're going to say that people who have different ideas are wrong and unscientific, you need to back that up with science. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. And the thing is, too, man, you got to watch out about what guys like Jude and what Saul and shit, right? Because a lot of the stuff in the Bible, I think the Bible, the Council of Nicaea, um, there's some things that weren't included, like the Book of Enoch that I think should have been. But at the same time, man, like people will use, they'll, they'll cherry pick biblical verses and shit all the time and, and try to use that to justify whatever the fuck they want to say. And there's no interpretation when it comes to the Bible. Honestly, there's, there's, there was one intention when up for every single verse, there was an intention with every verse, like people acting like the Bible's open to interpretation are deluded. And I think there's a difference in dogma, like the Catholic church, the reason that there was a schism was because of dogma. It wasn't because... Oh, people became, oh, people translated the Bible and got different interpretations. It was actually more like people reinterpreted the, the Bible and picked which dogma they want to keep and which ones they didn't want to keep. That's the main distinction. And to cherry pick the Bible and to claim that people do that all the time, they'll, they'll cherry pick a verse, they'll cherry pick a, a, an entire passage. But how many people actually follow the Bible? It's a question. Yeah. Bring up Leviticus and they act like it doesn't even exist. Even I do that because technically we don't live under the laws of uh, the tribes of Israel, which is what Leviticus details. Those are laws that specifically uh, apply to the, the Jews of that time. Um, and we're not beholden to the to the laws of that that covenant. Our covenant is the new covenant with Christ, not the covenant that was detailed in Leviticus. So, yeah, especially as Gentiles, it just doesn't apply to apply to us. Uh, but it's it's relevant. It's relevant, especially if you claim to be a Jew. Um, but if you're not a Jew, then Leviticus doesn't really apply to you because it's a uh, the covenant with Christ's sacrifice was different. So a lot of Christians are very passive when you talk about the Old Testament. Show them, uh, hey, we had Columbines, King Solomon. I mean, even the the genocide of like the Benjamin or finding like wives for the Benjaminites because you genocided them all. Um, so. I actually have Hebrews open. I mean, th what, what it speaks to in like female nature. One thing that all oh, people really shit on the Bible for like feminist stuff. And that's another reason why, again, feminism, second wave feminism was mostly led by Jewish women because Christian women weren't trying to say that the Bible was sexist. The Jewish women were. And if you actually look at who actually attacks Christianity, you'll find that Christians don't attack Christianity. Christians just passively let others attack Christianity. And then say that it's not an attack on Christianity. We're just trying to do heck and science here. But like the whole thing with like, oh, wives um, should be submissive to their husbands. And that being used as, oh, man, that's that's a heck and racism. You know, that's that's a heck and racism and or, or sexism or something. And, you know, the Bible like, oh, you know what? The Bible says that, you know, it doesn't mean it's like, no, it means what it means. It means if you're a wife, you, if you decide to get a husband, you shouldn't be trying to wear the pants in the relationship. You shouldn't be a domineering, overbearing wife. If you want to be a wife, if you want a man to stay with you as a husband, you need to be submissive. And women just, it's just, they, they lose their shit, even though it's as obvious as night and day. If you want to be with a man, who's a man going to want to be with? A woman who actually, oh, is humble and has humility or a woman who will constantly shit test you and go against you on things that you do because she wants to be the domineering. I want to be the dominant one. There's no, the dichotomy between submissive and dominant, is, there's no gray area. The dichotomy is strict. It's a black, white polarity. If you're not in, if you're not the, if you're not the dom, you're the sub. If you're not the sub, you're the dom. There's no if, answer or It's like, oh, we're equal partners. What the fuck does that mean? Equal fucking partners? Now I know that you're the sub. You don't even have to tell me like, oh, this is what you know. If you even if, if you as a man out of the words equal partners, you're a beta bitch. 
you're a beta bitch soy boy who left his balls at his mom's house when he moved out. There's no such thing as equal partners in a relationship. One person is assuming a dominant role versus the other. You can see it. It's, it's typical human behavior. You will see that there's, it's like equal partners. The power dichotomy in a relationship is imbalanced. Women have their power over a man. Men have their power over women. But the dichotomy naturally sees the man in a dominant position because that's what women also want. Women want a man that makes them feel secure, provides for them. If they have a baby, if they get pregnant, you know, if they just want to be a stay-at-home mom, they want a man who will be able to bring home the bacon to support that lifestyle. Hell, even if they want to travel, even if they're like, oh, I'm a boss-ass bitch about my thing, they still want a man to, to help pay their way through life, to buy them stuff, whatever. That security is a dominant behavior. That's dominant. You're not going to be paying the bills and not and be, and be a sub, or at least in that respect. But what women want is they want their cake and eat it too. They want a man to be dominant and traditional when it comes to his wallet and when it comes to kind of like what he's doing in his day to day. But when it comes to verses in the Bible that tell them to actually act submissive and, you know, do a little bit of cooking and cleaning and act feminine, then suddenly shit is just, oh, it goes way too far. Oh, the man, the man could do all the thing, all the things in the Bible with the man providing for his woman and taking care of his house and getting his affairs in order. Oh, all that shit's great. Oh, the man, men, you know, get your shit together, bro. Move out of your mom's basement, you know, stop being a fucking bum, clean yourself up, become a, become a member of society, you know, become a, be a man. But tell a woman to act submissive to her husband or to cater to her husband. And th these bitches lose their fucking minds, bro. It, it, they lose their minds like you just told them that women are animals or something. Like, it's so unbelievably sexist to, to actually expect women to be good wives. Yeah. There's always one person takes control. You listen to their opinion. It's a consideration you need to lead. Who is leading? Who's making decisions? Who's who's bringing home the bacon? Who's deciding to buy the house? Who's deciding to refinance? Who's deciding to uh, make big decisions? Who's deciding where they want to eat out? Who's deciding uh, what people are eating for dinner? There are power plays. Um, and a woman doesn't get that. It's like, oh, I have to cook and clean and do laundry. I'm like, that gives you total control over your home. That's the power you wield. You control the space. I dare you to find a single married man in this entire continent or this entire planet living with a woman where that woman does not control where that place looks like. Good fucking luck. Good luck moving in with any woman who's not going to have her way with how things look. Good luck. It, it, is, it is an inevitability that you cannot change. If you, your wife is going to turn your house into a home, and that's her role. It's what every man gets married for. Your wife should ideally make a house a home. doesn't matter if you're living in a tin shack or out of your car. Your wife makes the place a home, and you should care for your wife. That's what traditional men do. Domination, domination, submission and domination. Domination means responsibility. You don't have to do anything as a sub besides take, take up these stations. The submissiveness means that a man should not have to face pushback from his wife when making these tough decisions because the expectation is that the man is taking on the responsibility of maintaining or at least sustaining the household if the man is the one working and keeping the lights on even in a relationship where both are doing or the wife makes all the money whatever if you want to if you want to wear the pants backwards cool i mean many women won't even get with a guy who makes more money than but even in a relationship where the woman makes more money and even in a situation where the man makes more money the in the relationship where the man takes a submissive position they never last it doesn't matter who makes the money, who brings home the cheddar. It doesn't matter. I've seen sugar mamas with broke ass dudes and they're happy. So man actually leads. It's like, oh, where are we eating today? It's like the man still takes a lead because she still wants a man. You know, she wants a man. She wants somebody who's confident. You can't be confident and submissive. You can't be confident and submissive as a man. Prob as a woman, you can because women have incredible social mobility and flexibility when it comes to dealing with men comes to being in the home you could be very confident in the way you look as a woman hold yourself up well you could be fucking homeless and if you're cute you have high social capital so women could be very submissive and still be very confident in the way they look and do things men cannot i don't know how you could be a confident man and be a straight scummy bum like some dudes like diogenes kill it and again confidence again really is attractive. 
but men need men need that like it's hard to it's hard to be a man and not be in that dominant position because if you give up that dominant position women won't respect you like how is a woman going to respect a man who's submissive who expects her to make all the decisions you know expects her to take the lead and pay for the bill no that's like women see men like that as a burden they don't see that as cute they don't see that as like their duty they just see guys like that as a pain in the ass as dead weight and a lot of these modern women who divorce these their husbands who may not be making the most money that's almost always what happens like they're like oh this guy's this guy's dead weight this guy's a bum and this is the difference between because i've been called i think anybody who's ever gone onto like reddit or twitter or something has been called a nice guy because whatever oh they expected sex or something from a woman or whatever nice guy is it's it's a fabrication of of social media like a nice guy is simply any dude who goes to the dating game and genuinely tries to put his best foot forward with a woman gets rejected basically says that the woman's a bitch or something and then they're like oh this guy's a nice guy he just He's axonized because he wants to get laid. I prefer the term bitch made. Because a bitch made dude is going to try to be like a male feminist or something to try to get pussy. Or he'll try to like, he'll try to say stuff like, oh, you know, I, I care about what, but like he'll, he'll try to like chameleon skin his way into getting pussy and not realize that by being the ultimate gentleman, you're you're submitting to the woman by putting her on a pedestal. You know, if you treat a woman like a queen, she'll treat you like a peasant. And you're submitting to this woman because you are giving her a higher level of social status than what she's getting from the background. Because remember, if you as a man go up to a woman and start simping, there is no shortage of other simps out there. If you reduce yourself to the level of an orbiter or a simp, the woman's not going to take you seriously. She's going to do her own thing and you're going to be obsessing about her and she knows it. She wants you wrapped around her finger because she just she doesn't want you moving on with your life. She doesn't want you seeing other women. She doesn't want you doing shit. She wants you obsessed with her. And even if women say that they don't, they're like, oh, I don't want to deal with your shit, whatever. They're, every girl, and bro, take it from me because it just hap it happens to me constantly. Women who you get involved with, always just want to be friends it's like they want to end shit but they don't want to go through like the emotional damage of a breakup they just want to be friends like oh let's be friends be friends they don't want you to move on with your life like they don't want you to seriously go on and date other because the thing is if they wanted you gone they would just like you would just be gone forever they don't want you to get a set of balls and be like i'm not going to settle for being friends with you i'm if i want a relationship then i want a relationship and they can't stand that they can't stand a man that doesn't submit in every way shape or form because it's like men you'll you'll get your you'll get your time wasted they'll waste your time and like like you just said like stand your ground it's like if you stand your ground you'll filter out all of these other worthless ass women who, who will waste your time it, the 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 fall the folly of modern man is kind of Tripping head over heels for women who don't deserve it. Tripping head over heels for women who just want to manipulate you for attention or manipulate you for your wallet or manipulate you for whatever. Their main goal is to, is to see how much they can take and how much they can push. Standing your ground is essential because, again, the, the modern shit tester is going to try to push your buttons however possible. And this just happened to me this summer where a girl completely switches up on me like we have – like we're in a relationship, then she just switches up, acts like we were never in a relationship, tries to gaslight me into thinking that, oh, well, I didn't even want to be like, you know, taking things as far. I always just wanted to be friends. And so it's like, I don't know if it's feminism or the media trying to portray men as stupid that does this, but it's just, oh, this is, this is key. I wish I could star this. This is this is again what Marcus Aurelius says. Marcus Aurelius, Emperor of Rome, by the way, not just some random Yahoo on on YouTube. Marcus Aurelius said to not be a slave to your emotions. Um, but 
if the woman is not giving you what you want, then leave. And I explained to my now ex-girlfriend that this was the case. And they'll try to pull shit like, oh, well, we weren't really together as a boyfriend and girl. Well, they'll, they'll, they'll try to say like, well, I didn't really want to have sex. Or, oh, they'll try to say like, oh, like you're, they'll make sure that they'll try to deconstruct everything that, about your relationship being a lie because it removes all commitment for them. And then they'll try to say that you're a bad lover. They might try to say that you have this and this deficiency. They'll, they'll, they'll pull every, every trick in the book. You, you, you think of something, they'll try to do it. Because what's the end goal? It's like maximum emotional damage while deflecting all blame and accountability away from them. And then they still want to be friends because they want you as the guy to admit that you're wrong because you're just a stupid guy that doesn't know anything. That, of course, is pretty typical gaslighting. And anybody that can see or recognize gaslighting with any more than one brain cell will pick up on that. But modern women, especially these young girls, man, like like late teens, early 20s, they'll unironically try to pull this shit on you and then act like surprise Pikachu face and you're like, well, I'm going to drop the bullshit and dip. And they genuinely just, they don't expect it. It's like, it comes out of left field, like, oh, wait, you're just done? I'm like, yeah, fucking number blocks, just like at, like website 404, unsubscribed from your YouTube channel, unfollowed you on LinkedIn, like, bruh, it's over. And many women can't take that. They want their cake and eat it. And they want their cake and also to eat it with men but it's a waste of your time you'll get you, you will gain nothing from this friendship you will gain nothing from settling with this woman spend your time pursuing another woman if any woman fails in this regard if anyone presents you a massive red flag she don't want to be saved don't save her you are not captain save a you do not wear a cape you, you are not fighting justice. You are not a vigilante rescuing women from the streets. Don't do it. Bad idea to every every dude who watched the stream expecting pure scientific Silurian whatever. You 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 had the previous uh, two hours. Right now, this is this is the truth. Um. So modern relationships. I'm not going to bring this one up, but yeah, I'd like to talk to my family members. The woman doesn't provide. Should you want to leave? Um, yeah. All the women get angry because I see the dumpster fire that is modern relationships. The women getting angry at trying to like disengage, at, at men trying to disengage from relationships. A lot of that really just has to come down to the fact that they see themselves so much in modern women and they don't want to admit to themselves that they fucked up. Like I was raised by a single mother and most of the time when single motherhood does is it makes women raise their raise their man children as man children. They, they like they emasculate their sons while over masculinizing their daughters. They teach their daughters to be strong, independent women, and then teach their sons to be complete fucking quivering pussies. Um, but most of that stems from a lot of these false expectations. Like growing up, I was filled with all this shit about oh, you're gonna find your soulmate. No, you're gonna oh, just wait till you get to college. Some girl's gonna sweep you off your feet. It's all bullshit. You need game. You need you need a good physique. You need status in some way. You need I don't you need you don't need money. First and foremost, that is bullshit. Like that is that is hardcore. Not even close to being the truth. You should I think having your own place helps, but you do not need money to get women. You need confidence and you need game, and you need to have substance to your personality. You you don't go up to a woman and talk about your job. You don't go up to a woman and talk about your you know random this and that. Like you try to like get engaged with what she has to say, like let her know a little about about you, like tell a joke, you know, actually have some game, have some confidence in what you say. Don't be a stuttering idiot who hasn't showered in a week if you want to go up and actually spit some game and talk to a woman. And it could be anywhere. It could be at the grocery store. It could be in the parking lot waiting at the bus stop. Bro, I've seen guys who are bummy as hell, like my older brother, for example, get very beautiful women and he's broke is a fucking joke broke as shit broke ass nigga and women don't care these hoes in the streets you're casting your pros before swine being like oh man i gotta i gotta show up take her to a fancy restaurant and shit don't don't do it don't do it because all these girls are really looking for is a fun time they're looking for a fun fun time every girl you meet on twin tinder every one of these promiscuous women they're just looking for a fun time
So it, it's not even it's not even worth pursuing unless you're just looking to have fun. The goal is to have fun. That ultimately is the goal. The goal is to have as much fun as possible uh, in the time that you have. But unfortunately, I think we've come to a point in okay, sexual selection. Let's let's talk about sexual selection for a minute and apply it to what we see today. Sexual selection's entire function is to basically select the best genes possible, I guess, we're passing on. Even though sexual selection's very mechanism is one based on conscious choice that doesn't necessarily go along with benefits in other aspects of natural selection, such as getting away from predators. You know, is a human selecting for neoteny actually doing himself any benefits? Is the peacock selecting for the longest and shiniest iridescent feathers doing itself any other survival benefits? Is it even hindering it? Is having big ass horns or big ass antlers mostly just for sexual display doing me any benefits? That's the question. But with modern human relationships, it's hard to even call it sexual selection. It, it's it, These women don't want to have kids. I mean, we, we have negative birth rates in every single developed nation on this planet. And people say, oh, it's education. It's increased opportunity. It's birth control and contraceptives and abortion that cause the birth rate to be low. You, got, you get rid of the birth control pill. You get rid of condoms. You get rid of the uh, ability to abort babies. Birth rate's going to be as high as it was in the 18th century, homie. Ain't, ain't nothing going to, there's nothing more sophisticated in society but that. So the entire process of the reproductive cycle has changed. And it seems like all the different features that are present in society as a result of this current trend results in very unnatural and unassuming trends in how males and females in modern, in the modern day get along in the West and in other developed nations. Never before, bro, have men, for example, been expected to marry non-virgins. What period of history were men expected to marry non-virgins? What period of history were men expected to marry women uh, in their late 20s and early 30s? Or who were single mothers? Marrying women who never even were married, but still had kids out of wedlock. Never, ever, ever in history has that ever been expected until now. Never, ever in history have men expected to be able to have a no-fault divorce which never also never existed in history. No fault divorce. A woman could divorce you at any time. And even if there was no fault divorce, there wasn't child support and alimony. So you have men that are being victims of paternity fraud out there, uh, raising kids that aren't even theirs, paying child support um, to kids that aren't theirs, still being forced to do so because they're technically the dad. They were there when the birth certificate was whatever. Oh, you're married to this person. It's like today's society is so fucked that you can't even say natural selection is even at play here or that sexual selection is even at play. What's happening is that women are getting their cake and they are eating it too oftentimes, but men, men need to shape up because what men are doing now is they're forgetting that they have the ability to choose. Men are so obsessed with the chase. Men are so obsessed with simping over women. They don't understand that men are the linchpin of the home. It's like men are the linchpin of all of this, because eventually who's gonna, I mean, really, I mean, women can say whatever the fuck they want, but once you hit your thirties, the clock is ticking for having a family, having kids, your worth and your status as a woman becomes dog shit after like 35. No, no man really care. No man's going to want to marry and have a family with you, especially the men you want to go after. I mean, yeah, you'll, you can get with some salty cunt who's like 50 or 60. If you're like a 40 year old woman, nope, they're probably actually more than glad. But this man isn't going to give you children. He's not going to want children. This man may not even want to marry you. Because think about the modern millennial. I mean, the modern millennial, the oldest millennials, getting into the late 30s right now. They're, they're, I mean, these old Gen Xer dudes who will have three different divorces and they'll just marry, divorce, marry, divorce. Those are not the guys who are going to be the guys in their 40s and 50s in the next few years. Those guys are going to be millennials. And those guys are not going to marry anyone off anything that this generation of the of the boomer who just keeps getting married and divorced married and divorced that is not how our generation works you can even see it in the marriage rates Bach, rock, rock bottom marriage and birth rates but people who do get married stay married so by the time you get all of these 304s wanting to settle down the guys who are older than them all of these girls right now 
in their 20s and their 30s. Very, very poignant point. All these women in their 20s and their 30s, and people don't even know the long-term effects of birth control. You take birth control for 15 years, try to have a kid, and suddenly you can't. So it's not only that these women will find their reckoning uh, in their mid-30s trying to have kids and shit, but also you, you've been cooking your eggs in hormones or have been fucking with your uterus and ovaries for a decade and a half, and now you want to have a kid, and good luck. Good luck. You, you've, you've irreparably fucked your reproductive system by taking birth control for over a decade. So I know girls who have been taking birth control since they're like 14 years old. And now they struggle to have kids or they just get married. And it's just like they they're married, but still not pregnant, still not, you know, they're vaxxed and all this, whatever. But it's birth control. I think long term effects of birth control have not been well studied. And I think it's making women infertile, especially uh, earlier than they should be. But yeah, modern ultra feminism second wave did not show up until birth control. Modern birth control has been a plague in our society. It genuinely has. It's it's enabled a culture of promiscuity that's done everything from proliferate STDs to lead to a crisis of single motherhood. Dude, two thirds, and take it from me. You know, my mom was a, was a single mom, four sons. Two of those sons ended up in prison. Fifty percent. So, bro, it's like even in my own family, they can't say shit. Even in my own family, my mom can't be like, oh, well, single, there's nothing wrong with single motherhood. I'm like, bro, single motherhood is a is a crisis. Two thirds of criminals have a single mother background. Really? And that's provable. But with the DOJ and FBI statistics, two thirds come from a single mother background. An absolute majority of criminals, not even close, come from a single mother. Single motherhood is killing our society, dude. And ultra feminism has not been to the benefit of women whatsoever. How, how have women benefited from trying to compete in the workforce? They've taken over the workforce. They've taken over education. Congrats. Are you happy? So when all these women, especially these women my age, 10, year for, 10 years from now, I'm like, bro, most when I was, when I was uh, first getting introduced to a lot of what's going on today, yeah. Yeah. These follow up points, our generation of women. And that, that's what I'm speaking to is our generation. So I'm in, I'm in, I'm going into my late twenties, I guess, mid 20, whatever. It's a weird period. I have my birthday next month, I guess the beginning of my late twenties, whatever the fuck that means. But so this generation of women, the women that I know that are my age are already just like, they're, they're off the fucking rails, the biological clock. And I'm in that last year of the millennials. Like, really, like, I am cutting it close. Um, I'm a borderline Zoomer. But um, this generation, my generation, the women in their mid-20s right now, like, dude, five years from now, five years from now, I feel like I'm still going to look the fucking same. As long as I keep my hair, I'm going to mostly look the fucking same that I did now. I'm a, I'm a dude who most people confuse for 19. Like, I feel like even if I, 10 years from now, I still feel like I'll look it, like I'm in my mid-20s. If I, if I if everything goes right, if I don't catch catch on fire, I should still look like I'm in my, like, mid to late 20s. A woman 10 years from now who's my age, dude, is not going to look like she's in her mid-20s. That is the curse that every woman is experiences. Like, men... I mean, it is the struggle, bro. Like most men, it is the struggle. But there's a reason why our sperm is so viable at older ages because it takes time for men to establish themselves. Like the amount of effort it takes to, to secure a family, that's a lot. And we've been blessed in earlier periods where having, having that has been a guarantee. But bro, people didn't even leave the Roman army until they were 28 years old. Your ass was owned by Rome for at least a decade. And many men didn't retire until their 30s. You know, so it's like, yeah, you can have a wife and stuff during campaign, but most Roman men weren't even on the dating market until they're in their late twenties. I'm 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 at the age where I'd still be in the Roman army if I was born in Roman times. So, is it a fair stretch? Like, if if you take 
Rome from 756 to 476 and then go past that to Byzantium even. Even if you just look at that era of Rome that's like half a millennia long where this was a thing, that's half a millennia of generation after generation of man marrying women like 10 to 15 years younger than themselves once they got out of the Roman army. They were, they were mostly married teenagers with some exceptions, but most, if you were a man, this is what you did. Get out of the Roman army, like going at 18, leave at 28. And then you get married. And like, that's normal for men. It's not for women. Women want to act like they're men. She got makeup, etc. <laughs> yeah. hundred percent. You could see that with a, uh, Female politicians like Sana Marin is a good example of that. Um, it's honestly trying to make money off women, unless you're a pimp, is just a waste of time. You're better off. The best way to make money is to just be broke, get with a woman with money, and then divorce her. Like divorce. I don't know. It's it's like doing a reverse Uno card on the divorce game, but. Yeah, that's funny. The, the supposed plant that uh, caused abortions, we, we don't really have any evidence for. We don't know what it was. It was probably That's probably true. I, I've heard of that. And that was that was actually precedent for Roe v. Wade that the, that women use tinctures and shit to have, you know, get rid of their fetuses. But at no point was that actually ever legal, which is a big reason why Roe v. Wade got overturned. Again, which caused a bunch of fetching. But yeah, so... Here's another thing, the, the concept of hypergamy, and there's nothing wrong with hypergamy, um, monkey branching to a better man. Uh, the, the thing is with the monkey branch is if you pursue the monkey branch, you don't end up with the safe man. Um, yeah, but you got to put up with, the, with, with that. But, okay, just divorce your money. So there's a reason why this isn't more... Um, where this is more prevalent. Uh, so women, hypergamy makes women want to pursue the best option possible because women, just by virtue of being women, a lot of them, if they're attractive, they'll attract every single caliber of man. So a seven out of 10, you know, not, not anything that groundbreaking, like maybe she has um, a few decent assets here and there, uh, but she can attract a man who may be a 10 out of 10 movie star. Who knows? Like, as long as a woman looks well to be decent, men's t tastes are so varied that I don't, it's, I mean, it's the same with men. Like, it's never game over. But a woman, it's a purely physical contest. And women just, again, they think that their income and their education level matters. It is a physical contest at the end of the day. And, again, no woman wants to swallow that pill. They don't want to admit it's a beauty contest. They don't, they want to act like, you know, big is beautiful. But for all of these, all these women who, Make money off the dogs. Oh, I see what you mean. It's like a like the richest man in Babylon said to accumulate assets that make you more assets, or that are not depreciating assets. So you don't want you want assets, not liabilities. And your your woman should be an asset to your life. She she should help you basically relieve your stress, help you have a home to come to, help you uh, basically just be a better man, be a better person. And that should, that should apply to everyone in your life. If you don't have a woman that's trying to make you a better man or you, you're not with a woman uh, that respects you or doesn't want to build you up, doesn't want to see you succeed, who criticizes you, who shits on you, leave. Don't don't get married and see how things... Don't leave. If, you're not, if you don't have a ring on that finger, if you don't have kids with that girl, if she's not building you up, if she's not there for you, if she doesn't have your back, if you fall on hard times and she leaves, like, fuck that bitch. Does not matter. That, that goes for everybody. It goes for friends, goes for homies, goes for family members. If these people don't respect you, if they don't have your back, there's no point. And it applies to a woman as much as it applies to a man. Um, <laughs> the She-Hulk show. I still have to watch it. I I, I, I have it. I'll, I can even post the link. Um, I'm going to watch it on like Soap today. But Oh, I'm dreading it because I just know it's going to be cringe. I already watched the. I unfortunately already watched a, a video that critiqued it. I don't think it gave any major spoilers though, but 
yeah, the She-Hulk thing. But look, what is being a career woman done for women? What does a career mean? It means, okay, look at the age of consent. This is controversial. Nobody wants to talk about cunning. Nobody wants to talk about the age of consent. But what the age of consent meant was meant to do, it was started by English suffragettes, English women, uh, or not English women, but just uh, Christian women who wanted young girls to go through primary education and secondary education without getting married. So if we raise the age of consent to 16 to 18, then, then basically what they can do now is proclaim that, okay, if women can't get married till they're 18, then they have to, they're basically going to go to school. They're going to finish their schooling before they get married. All right. Before that, the age of consent was like 10 across most states. But now it's, it was 16 to 18 now in those states. Then they decided, okay, well, we still don't want women getting married before they get to college. We want to be able to influence and get our hands on them. We want women to enter the workplace. It all happened after World War II. And what started to happen is that the communists, they started letting their women into all these spheres of life. They started seeing the benefits. So there was this big push by socialists back at home. It was an actual legitimate act of subversion. Um, and like, look at, look at people like Barbara Feldman who created the word sexism and stuff like that. Like there was this big push to create hostility, uh, through, through the men and the women. And then also using birth control and using contraceptives to legitimize a lifestyle of hedonism that not only prevented women from getting married, but prevented them from being marriageable material in the first place. There, the goal of second wave feminism, the feminism that we saw up here in the 60s and 70s, was to make marriageable women no longer attractive to men. That's the goal. It was all an attack on nuclear family. Make a bunch of man-hating, misogynistic, unwashed feminists that don't want to be with a man. Take them out of the dating game. We don't want these people reproducing. We don't want these people making more people. We want to depopulate society and get and consolidate control over the layman. And this has been something that's been happening for hundreds of years. I mean, most of feudalism was exactly this, using famine and taxation to control how much, how much goods and supplies and self-sufficiency peasants were able to do. They don't want you self-sufficient. They'll tax you until you're not self-sufficient and then give you a handout. And people don't see that it's the same exact shit that people have been doing forever. Oh, I'm just going to tax you till you're broke, and then I'm going to give you a handout to help you out. Not a single person in this country would need Social Security if the money that they put into Social Security was put into a bank account instead or put into an IRA. Like, who the fuck needs Social Security? That money that I'm paying into it, I won't see a single cent of it. That's what a lot of this is with a lot of these relationships now. If you're going up to any of these women, who are purely in it for them, who've never been able to maintain a relationship with a man in their entire fucking life, who don't know the meaning of a long-term relationship and expecting them to be good wives and mothers, you can blame feminism. But women are ultimately accountable for their actions and men are accountable too. Every man that brings a child into this world and is either a bum himself, was not ready to have the kid, or simply decided just to impregnate, it's a two-way street. These men who ignore red flags or act reckless and then don't want to do this and don't want to like, oh, uh, now I've fucked up. It's like, man, nobody's perfect. But men letting women get to this point is a large amount of, what, of what's happened. If men is a total, I mean, people, women talk about a sex strike. If men legitimately stopped simping, if every man in this country boycotted social media, decided I'm no longer going to go on to Twitch, I'm going to delete my OnlyFans, I'm going to get off Discord. I'm going to um, uninstall Instagram and Facebook Messenger. Every single girl from the ages of like 12 years old to 62 is going to, uh, I'll, I'll say 42, is going to universally fetch and shake and cr like cry and scream about the sexism and injustice of these men performing a mass attention boycott, silent treatment on women. It's attack against women. Men decide to boycott women most affected. And she's brave, strong, and independent, don't need no men. Every single one. Every single one until they get to be like 35 with their kid and feel that twang of loneliness. It happened to my mother. It happens to every single single mother I know. And it never just works out. And I, I see it happen. I just, I just cringe at it. Because my own family, if anything, is the biggest example of it.
manual. A lot of people don't want to talk about the history of things because it makes people uncomfortable. I was recently in a uh, Discord chat. I don't know if you guys know about French Baguette or whatever. Uh, he makes these like long-winded memes or whatever. <sighs> History is not kind to a lot of people's sensitivities. People mention like the Crusades, but they never mention what happened before the Crusades. Like why are why are there Muslims in Palestine when the Crusaders arrived? When there were, were previously only Christians and Jews? Hmm. It's almost as if another Crusade or Jihad happened to actually Islamize that area first things first. And keep in mind the crusade only happened three centuries after the Islamic conquests. So, you know, it's not like they're taking down these ancient, but, but history is inconvenient for the narratives of a lot of people. Biology is inconvenient for the narratives of a lot of people. Philosophy is inconvenient for the narratives of a lot of people. Chemistry and physics is inconvenient for the narratives of a lot of people. There is a large amount of ignorance that is purported to be the, the purest manifestation of moral correctness. Because these people who have ditched and shed all traditional religion for their more enlightened beliefs are doing so predicated upon tolerances that are contrived. If I'm going to be pro-working class as a socialist, and I'm pro-LGBT and all this stuff, and I want to, I'm saying that I'm trying to be for the benefit of society, all this stuff, have these lofty ideals, maintain the social contract. I'm like, well, you demonize anybody who doesn't agree with you. Most of the working class that you claim to espouse, you, you declare as rednecks or you disparage them as being worth like saying, oh, we, we, we can't have voter ID laws because black people don't have IDs is a crock of bullshit. And it's so insulting to insinuate that black people are either too poor or too stupid to get a federal ID to vote, when in reality, you just want illegal immigrants to vote. That's really it. You just want anybody's, anybody to vote. And it's hard to even, and then they want to pander to people based on race or ethnicity. Like, oh yeah, we're, we're so inclusive, you know, like we need to have, you know, we'll have a cherry blossom festival in San Francisco, while at the same time, uh, claiming that, oh, there's too many, too many Asian people in our universities. So we're, we're, we're very inclusive. So we're going to intentionally bar Asian students from joining universities because we're they're honorary whites basically. They're no different than these white people. You know, white privilege exists with Asians too. So even though Asians had to deal with um, decades, if not centuries, of discrimination, oh, you're too smart and you take up too many university spaces that uh that blacks and other minorities that want to vote for us are taking up. So yeah, sorry, Asians, you're you're no longer a discriminated group anymore. You're no longer a protected class. You are you are now honorary whites and are a problem. So. How long is it going to take for the same thing to apply to white Hispanics? Oh, well, your grandfather, um, he claimed that he was a white Hispanic on his census. You therefore lied about being a white, uh, um, a non-white Hispanic, a mestizo on your forms. Pretty, pretty rough sell, you know. What's well, good for the goose ain't good for the gander. You're just another white, white person trying to apply to this job or something. And it's like, how, how is one form of discrimination better than the other? And now this is happening with men. The racial discrimination thing is just a complete distraction from all the other stuff happening. Like if we look at women most affected, 100%. But I want to take it back here. Okay, so there's there's two points. Um, I, I'll go for this one. Let me see. I think this is a this is this is a point one the, the accountability argument. It takes accountability to be with each other and our neighbors. It takes accountability to uphold the social contract. So John Locke talked about the social contract, and he's the one who mainly detailed it. Hobbes talks about utilitarianism, um, in in a sense of how to respond to nature, like nature's utility by being exploited, or further extrapolations upon um, how people act. And this is the Enlightenment movement. So this is. These are declarations about how one can use general reason instead of religious dogma to get along with people. So not just like Ten Commandments stuff, like love thy neighbor stuff, but genuinely, how do we get along? And the notion of the social contract emerged from the realization that within every society, there's a large amount of tacit, unspoken laws and rules that people adhere to in order to get by with other people. You know, it may not be against the law to do something of ill repute, like if you blow your nose at a restaurant. Um, that there's no rules against that. People will do that, but it's seen as uncouth. You know, there's systems of politeness emerge. 
based off the social contract. But also the social contract is like, yeah, I can leave my doors unlocked because my neighbor's not going to rob me. Or I can trust this person. Um, yeah, I can trust this other person in society because I know he gives up all the markers that indicate that he's worthy of trust. So in society in America, we're trying to let people of different religions, of different races, of different creeds and ethnicities, of different national origins and everything live together. And if people don't come to terms on equal ground in at least a few of those areas, you're just going to have a hostile and broke down society. Like, for example, bro, Poppy was jumped and that's why he's not here. And I'll probably try to get a chop up with him soon. But dude, it's like you can't even walk around a major city in America at dusk anymore without getting jumped, let alone keeping your door or car unlocked. And that's a result of a breakdown of the social contract. Accountability comes in on a personal level. Am I going to be accountable for my safety by carrying a gun? Am I going to be accountable for my friends by making sure I don't put them in the situation in the first place? Where does my accountability end as a citizen to ensure that I don't get mugged by a bunch of random doctors and engineers on the street? And my message often is unpopular in this respect, especially since I want to Since I want to like, yeah, so I guess I'll explain it on a, on another one. Yeah. That the surprise is warranted. So yeah, he, I don't have too much information. I'm going to let him explain it. I'll try to get him on a chop up tomorrow or uh, the next day and kind of go over it. It's been, uh, yeah, it's been busy times, but yeah, he's okay. He showed me some pics and he's kind of messed up, but he'll, he'll be fine. But yeah, bro. It's uh, just Oakland business. I'll let him explain, explain it when he comes on. However, this is not the first time he's been jumped. I vividly remember other times where he's uh, had altercations. But it's, it's a bit tragic to live in a first world country and still have to experience this shit. And the warfare between men and women that I see and the warfare between races and all of this, is, it's mostly contrived. There's nothing really of substance there. These are all conflicts that are completely artificial. Like Americans don't have any larger problems, but yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's a, it's a bit rough. You, you guys have the right feeling. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to let him, uh, I'm going to let him take this L and recuperate, but I'll, I'll let him know that you guys wished him well. Yeah. And I, although this stream did begin with a slight learning, it's still going to remain a critique uh, through history. And I guess other people looking at these critiques for their, um, for, for purely for that content can, I guess I'll leave a timestamp or something, but I guess, I guess the, the major meat of what I wanted to address between male and female relations is the fact that there is some redemption. Like I still want to remain white pill throughout all of this. I know how bad things are with the courts and how bad things are with the institution of marriage and how bad things are with the state of modern women. But I think as long as you don't settle and you hold your ground and you look around, even globally, for the right types of women, you can find what you're looking for. You just have to put yourself out there. You have to go to the places where you think you're going to find the woman that you want. And that applies for women, too. It's like there's still decent women out there. I mean, it's not unicorn hunting yet, I don't think. But you know what you're getting into when you get with a modern woman. When you get with a woman who you know is like – because like the last girl's with it, all super hippy-dippy. I could tell that she – has taken a few too many hits of MDMA maybe. Uh, but it's like, on one hand, you feel like, wow, I'm really, I'm really being picky or I'm really like, I'm, I'm being too obsessive, but are you really? That's the question. Am I really being picky? If the, if it means that I'm not going to end up in a courtroom having to give up half my money to a woman that I just happen to have a kid with or you know, giving up uh, a large percent of my paycheck just because she decided to get a divorce. Or am I going to put my family through all of this? Have my, you know, ask for her like father's blessing and get attached to a family only for her to blow up all of this connections just because she wants to live life and find herself at like 30. It's hard for me to justify as a man getting married before 30 years old. Um, I know friends who do and have one friend, my buddy Tim got married right out of high school. And I just feel like right when you're building your cheddar, right when you're trying to build your life, having a woman right there by your side for that is great. But the risk you run 
of accumulating all of the assets you'll ever have after you get married and then having that woman take half of everything you've ever created plus a little off the top every month for alimony it's purgatory it's like financial purgatory and i think that more than anything it's because it's not the modern woman it's like you know you could pick up any cherry picked um hoe off a college campus any thought off the street and apply this but what makes it intolerable is the government at the end of the day it's really the government it's really the institutions promoting this just like with evolution going through this entire uh going through this entire spiel with the silurian period is mostly just to influence and, and highlight um, the same conversations and topics that I was highlighting before, which is the very me mechanism by which these people espouse that all this is created doesn't work in their favor from a scientific perspective. And similarly, we can see that the intention of the courts to enfranchise women by not letting them just be financially on their ass is incentivizing this negative behavior, both for predatory women who know that they don't need half this nigga's money to survive like like Bezos's wife, but also the notion that men are just tools. Like, oh, this is what should be expected of you in a divorce. A divorce should be a divorce. No one should get anything out of a divorce. If a woman decides to divorce her husband, there shouldn't be shit waiting for her. Seriously, like, oh, my husband abused me. He's a piece of shit. Okay, then leave and build a new life. That man doesn't owe you anything. If you, if you divorce me, how do I owe you anything? How are you owed a single thing? If you decide to leave, bye. Why is my fortune suddenly half my fortune belong to you? Because the institution of marriage is supposed to be two parts becoming one. But the government has taken the institution of marriage and created all these legal caveats to it to the point where I wouldn't even get, I would get married at a church, but I would never file any paperwork with the state. So why the fuck do people do it? Why do men keep doing it? Because they're gullible fucking simps. They're gullible sims who think that they'll never be happy, that they'll never, you know, have their family, have kids. I'll never, you know, find anybody better than her. And they go along with raw deals and they lose the girl anyway. You've lost the girl regardless. You've already lost her. She's monkey branched. She, her, her boss at work's made a pass at her. She's doing her thing, going out for her girls' nights and shit. And it's not worth it. And these two bangers, all women are like this. This is this is a universal thing from from all the way from South Korea to Manhattan, all throughout the world. We see this, and it's unfortunate. And men do the same thing. Are men are the same way across all of these? It's not just women. All men are like this too. There's an amal quality to this as well. We see the same typical traits for men as well in these countries. The South Korean and Japanese man are just as pussified as the typical American or British man. It's, it's, again, simps are doom. We see the same simps everywhere. And then here, the people being subjugated to the government. This is, men are the principal taxpayers in society. That's just a statistical fact. And the best way to extract money from men? Child support, alimony, asset reduction. Who's getting that? Oh, they would love for you to just kill yourself in your 40s. Then all your assets would go to your state or your next of kin. The government makes money off a divorce. Remember that. The government makes money from this fucking divorce court shenanigans. The divorce court is what ultimately drives men away from marriage. Women, it's not that big of a deal. Because men ultimately have the ability to choose their mates too. No man is forced to marry any woman in society. No matter how she looks. I, I can't be forced to marry a woman just because she's the most drop-dead gorgeous woman in society. I'm not obliged to do that. There's no obligation for me to put a ring on a finger at any point. I could be with a woman for 10 years, 15 years. This is in Australia. We don't have common law marriage. This woman can cohabitate with me, have my kids, even change her name. But as, if I don't sign a marriage certificate, she's not my wife on paper. And she's not obligated to any of my assets. She could sue me, but it's not going to hold up in court. We're not in Canada and we're not in Australia where, unfortunately, things have happened. But this is it. The incentives to get a divorce exist purely because there is no disincentives to getting a divorce for a woman. What disincentive do you have? When you're looking at an almost 70% likelihood of retaining custody, majority custody of your children, regardless of your employment status, it's all cases of divorce. Almost 70% of women retain custody majority of the kids. 
ninety percent of cases where alum or ninety percent of cases where alimony is, is received, the recipient is the woman. Seventy percent of all divorce is initiated by women. Child support payments. You want you want to take a gander at that? Guess guess who who's paying the most child support? It's at um, right around 90% as well. I think it's like 85%-ish. Guess who's paying? So we live in this equal society, right? We live in this equal, beautiful, egalitarian society where men and women are equal. Women still have to deal with the glass ceiling. They're so discriminated against. But remember... The same scientists that are telling you the vax is safe and effective, the same scientists telling you that you come from pond scum and fish, same scientists that are going to tell you that women, men and women are absolutely the same in all respects. And that being a man in society gives us certain privileges that women don't. But I don't see it. I've never seen it in my entire life. It's like it's, it's this principal form of gaslighting that tries to convince you that being a man is superior to being a woman. And that we live in a patriarchy. I don't see it. Where's the patriarchy? Are women allowed to drive cars? Yeah. Are women allowed to be CEOs? Yeah. Are women allowed to be president? Yes. Are women allowed to hold a political office? Yeah. Who are the biggest recipients of affirmative action? Who are making up the majority of education, both, both pre and post grad since 1980s? Who are currently dominating uh, the private sector? in service industry jobs and in education and healthcare, not men. It's all women. I, I mean, men are still doing like the blue collar building jobs and stuff, you know, the stuff that actually maintains society, but good luck having those men be taken seriously by women. If you're a plumber or an electrician, they're going to look at you like you're a fucking idiot. You'll make twice as much money as these girls. That's what, that's what, that's why money doesn't matter. It's why money does not matter. You can easily make twice as much money as these women easily twice as much money as these women and they'll still look at you like a fuck you're a fucking dirt poor peasant if you were digging ditches mowing lawns driving trucks constructing airplanes doing any job that they perceive as blue collar oh i work as a as an overseer on a construction site They're like oh oh he works again that overseer is making one hundred and thirty thousand dollars a year that project that 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 site manager is making $150,000. Work for Caltrans, make 40 bucks an hour. You're just a cone layer. You're nothing. Your job is not high status. But where, what status do these women have to justify that, that attitude? That's where I don't care about the mate selection attitude because any man with a brain wouldn't select a woman like that. Why, why does this woman care so much about money when she's broke as hell and doesn't take care of herself? No man with a brain is going to pick that woman. They don't have to. That's a woman's problem, not a man's. The man's problem is when he does actually decide to wife that woman. Any woman. She could put on a cute face. And this is the danger of just pointing out the thought or pointing out the roasty. Is that there are so many of these demon-ass gold-digging women who, were, who will give you the whole born-again virgin song and dance. They dress conservatively. They're like, they, they want to be the perfect girl. And the moment you slip a ring on that finger, you are fucked. Absolutely capital F-U-C-K-E-D fucked. Because it's all, a, it's all a spiel. And especially these mail-in brides are the same way. They, guys will get these brides and then they'll bring them to America. This one I'm a little afraid of with Poppy, but I think, you're, I think you'll be okay. But it's like, they'll get these wives, they'll bring them to America, and bro, what happens? They make a couple American girlfriends and they, they're bad. It all falls apart. Your little trad wife is suddenly out, you know, wearing lingerie. You didn't buy her and shit. So you got to be careful. Yeah. Stand your ground like this. We're all going to make it. Yeah. And see, this is the truth. They see you ignorant. 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 Most of these girls can't even fucking hold a conversation about anything besides a zodiac sign they don't even know which pantheon the fucking zodiac came from and they want to say that you're ignorant because you're getting paper i honestly like i am being a notary i like i don't make shit for money as a notary but i still get taken so much more seriously 
than people who work jobs that make a magnitude more money than I do. Like being a notary public gives you a certain amount of clout, I guess. So that's the ethos that comes with the job. But I don't I, fucking hell. I don't. I wish I made as much money as truck drivers do. I wish I made as much money as carpenters as or plumbers, whatever. It's like, bro. But, but. It's all about status, bro. I, again, I often don't even tell women what I do for work. I, I'll tell them what I am, but I'm, I'm not going to tell them particulars of what's going on in my life. In fact, if they ask, I'll tell them, but I'm not even going to, if they say like, oh, tell me about you, I'm not even going to mention what I do for work. I'm going to tell them about myself, not, not about my employment. I think it's all irrelevant information, but the fact that women have that, I think that works in my favor. I think it works in all of our favor, I think, at least for me, because I like when women underestimate me. Because it allows me to fuck with them. Being underestimated is never a bad thing. Remember that. Being underestimated is a tool in your advantage. If a woman thinks you're ignorant because you're a trucker, then just talk with her about any subject in depth. Talk to her about, because for me, I, I know a lot about a lot. So, but I mean, even for you, if you know something about your, even your own history, your country, something that gets her out of her depth, it's always a beautiful realization to realize like, oh, wow, this guy who I thought was ignorant isn't that ignorant after all. But it's sad because one of the reasons, even though I say like it's contrived, the, this hostility, the actual expectation that men are ignorant and dumb, that's so pervasive amongst young women these days, is honestly damaging in a personal sense. That's why I'm really not often befriending many of the women I meet in university, because they genuinely think, even if I have better grades than them, if I score better than them, more active in class, they either resent you for your intelligence or they just think you're a fucking dumbass. But they, they'll try to be like, oh, sorry, um, I, I, I was off my phone for the weekend or something. Like, I constantly see you on your phone. It's like, oh, I don't really text a lot. I'm like, women will genuinely like feed you shit that is just mind-blowingly stupid. They don't even have any nuance to it because they just think you're dumb. Like, that's how insulting it's become for men is that there's this expectation that we are legitimately just retarded and don't know any better. And that if we were just a bit more educated, there would be no rape or wars or sexisms or anything like that. And it's just created a monster where young men in education are being basically taught like you're a rapist in the making. And it's, it's just a few neurons of self-control stopping you from just raping every woman in sight and you need to be contained. And it's fucking up with generations of young men. Like simps are created... I think because of the single woman epidemic, but also because men are just not have taught how to be men. There's no rites of passage in our society that make boys into men. This is why, even though I'm against, I'm not a huge fan of the military, I think forced conscription would not be a bad thing. I think like even just something like, you know, just getting men able to go out to the woods, just like making Boy Scouts a thing in schools, like a prerequisite or something, like knowing how to start a fire or guide by a compass, like do something that gives men some kind of, you know, rite of passage in our society, but men don't have it. Women's rite of passage is college. They get to fucking suck their way through four to seven years of university and it's all just home free. And then they get out of college and pretend that they weren't a sorority girl. And I see it all the time on Insta. I have friends that are just like this. The benefit of being um, in my mid to late twenties is getting to see this slow, gradual transformation of the fucking party girl, sorority girl, who I know has like triple digit body counts by now must have. And then them settling with some beta cuck provider dude who just acts like my girlfriend wasn't a whore in college. And you just see it time and time and time again. And this, this is solid. Depends on the way you approach and the confidence that we have. They don't want to follow my lead. Yeah. There's nothing lost. This is why it pays to be choosy as a man and why you want to be choosy as a man. Cause there's nothing. It's just like, it's just like with women. if women have this attitude that no man's special, you as a man need to have the attitude that no woman's special. It's just, it's just genital differences and secondary traits. Physically speaking, all the looks will fade. If you're, if you're purely in it and getting obsessed with a girl purely because of how she looks or because she gives you attention, it's a typical trap to fall into. I'm not saying that, you know, I can leave my balls at the door. I know how I feel when I'm, I'm around a girl that I like and I'm attracted to. But again, it's like forcing myself to disengage with that woman. That's not, that's not a problem because there's, it's, if you know, it's not going to work, it's not going to work. You know, it's not going to work either. She's not attracted, which you can't force attraction, or there's just things about it that you don't like. And you just, oh, I have to swallow it. It's like, don't, 
dumb. Because for every second you're entertaining a girl that you know that you're not into, there's other women that you could possibly be following that are being ignored or just opportunities not taken because you want to pursue a promising lead that isn't promising whatsoever. Yeah, she will say she's a born again virgin. And that literally, that kind of happened to me with this last relationship of mine where the girl was suddenly like, oh, I don't think I... I, I want to have sex before before marriage and all this stuff like that. And I, I don't want to live in sin is what she, what she put it. I'm like, it is way too late for that. And if you want to go with go down that route, then have fun. But like women also think that men don't remember shit that they say. That's another thing. It isn't just men are ignorant. It's that men have short-term memory loss and can't remember shit that I've said to them, which happens all the time. And it is easily probably the most frustrating behavior I've, I just generally get from anybody as, as far as personal pet peeves, the expectation that I, that I can't like pick up on stuff. I, I don't know. It's just that assumption that I'm dumb. That kind of messes with me personally, but yeah, the born again virgin stay away from those girls, man. No, no girl in church in her mid twenties talking this born again, like talking about like, Oh, it's like, okay. Okay. You're, you're dressed in a mid thigh length, cocktail dress in church and you're 25 years old and you already have a college degree from a public state level university and i'm supposed to believe that you've never been with a man and i'm supposed to just go and handhold with you and go to coffee dates and then we'll see where things go and we'll, we'll, we'll wait till marriage get the fuck up out of here again they're looking for that provider because the christian a solid christian dude who's about his morals is a perfect for women they want this guy to be a virgin with no experience because guess what if they're a whore and they know that they've whored out and they've had their fun with other and they don't give a shit about this guy they just want someone to provide then it's perfect he knows oh he's not going to chase other women he's going to be the perfect husband he's going to be the perfect beta for me but the thing is is that those those same guys and this is what all of these women find out those guys aren't stupid most of the guys i know like that are very well aware of girls like that they they can smell they can smell a thought from a mile away. And they've been BTFOing thoughts, a lot of these guys, for years. Because many of them are not unattractive in cell dwelling, you know, neckbeards. I know a lot of guys who did wait until they're, you know, wait until sex till marriage, and they were in their 30s. So it does this does not apply to women. I feel like celibacy and, and virginity is so much more prevalent among men than women, especially at this point. There's exceptions to the rule, but I have yet to meet a woman who's past 25 who's uh who's still a virgin. I, I have known plenty of men who are well into their 30s as virgins. But yeah, it's and it's difficult. If she's not breaking rules for you, it doesn't follow your lead. If she has done this and had this relationship with other men, this is why I walked away from this relationship. You cannot tell me to swallow a pill that no other man in your life has been expected to swallow. I even told her, like, am I supposed to be your guinea pig for this? Am I just supposed to be your trial run? Because I'm not going to do that. Like, I'm not going to be a friend or in a relationship with somebody like this. And I told her straight up, like, and she she laughed at this, but I could tell it was like a laugh of pure pain because she didn't expect it. But it's like, why should I be in a relationship with you? And I've done this to other girls, too. And it, every time it makes them rage. What? Why should I be friends with somebody like you? That question alone. Why should I be friends with somebody like you? It's with somebody who treats me like this. With somebody who switches up on me. With somebody who's trying to play me. Like I've had three different occurrences just in the last four months, my dudes, four months, the last four months, three different girls I've had to pull this shit with where I'm like, why should I be your friend? Why should I be in a relationship with you? Why should I, why should I be your friend? And every time, why should I put up with the one girl? She wanted to pull a born again virgin on, thing on me. And I knew that she was having other one night stands with dudes. She even told me about it. Acted like I didn't remember. She got hella pissed and left. And I felt bad that I shouldn't have I shouldn't have said shit. I should have let her walk away. Women like that want to play you. They notice that you're soft and care for them, but they take that kindness for weakness. They they confuse compassion for softness. And it's dangerous. You cannot realistically paint yourself in this in this corner where as a man I have to I have to make myself appealing to women. And I have to make myself this perfect caricature of what a woman wants. But you should just be yourself. You should just be your own man and do what you want to do. 
because that's ultimately what's going to get you the person that you want. You know what you're looking for. Every man does. It's like, you know what type you want. You know what kind of girl you're kind of looking for. You're keeping your mind open. But if you're deliberately <laughs> not softness, simpness, I mean, the simp is the quintessential submissive male. And I think, I think that is a fair point, David, because you could be a simp and not be soft. Like you could be one of these big, tough tap out t-shirt wearing dudes and still be a massive weeping simp for a girl. Like the whole white knight, I think is the quintessential example of a guy who's not soft per se, but he's, he's totally a simp. Like if you're going to be like beating a guy's ass over a girl who you don't even know the name of, you're a simp. And I see these guys all the time. You'll see them and they'll act all hella tough. Like, yeah, but you pick on someone your own size. And they'll act all tough like this is some fucking 90s song cartoon. And it's just like, bro, you getting into a literal fist fight with a guy over some random broad is cringe. That is so cringe. Especially if it's someone else's girl. Like, hey, I'm so glad you're here. I don't know where my boyfriend is. And seeing that kind of stuff at like a concert or a venue, I'm just like, bro, you just got yourself kicked out of a concert and probably are catching a charge in court over a girl Who's not going to fuck you, bro? Like, she's not going to go out with you. Like, what the fuck are you doing? And this is expectation is not made for men on women. This is the thing is, I'm an egalitarian. I believe in equality. But what I see instead is that men are expected to uphold tradition when women are not. And I'm going to uphold tradition in a more or less vague sense for the fact that I think a, tr a traditional mindset is what's good for men. I don't think men should be trying to emulate their female counterparts in that sense. I don't think men should be hedonistic about how they live their lives. But, yeah. Yeah, it's, you cannot be, un, you you have to be unapologetic. And you have to have no shame in what you do at, at all times. If you have any self-doubt, if you are un, insecure, insecurity is not a masculine trait. Men are not insecure boys are insecure you're going through puberty a teenage boy is insecure a beta cuck is insecure but a man is not insecure a man should be doing what he does all right see you soon david i might i might i'm gonna pass a three-hour mark so i might start wrapping it up in the next five minutes but i'll I, I hope that you're here when i start doing it but men, men aren't insecure men aren't insecure men by the very nature of being masculine by being confident in their actions Confidence and insecurity don't don't mix well. So if you're so weak in your convictions, it's the, the same thing rounding back to lukewarm Christians. It's like if you're so weak in your conviction that you won't just stand by your guns and demand a certain quality of what you want out of a woman, what you want out of friends, what you, what you want out of a job. It's these guys who constantly settle. They settle, 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 settle. And no one respects them. Their boss doesn't respect them. Their work doesn't respect them. Their coworkers don't respect them. Their wife doesn't respect them. Their kids don't respect them. It's pathetic to watch. And it's something I saw all the time with these Gen X dudes. Boomer dudes, yeah, this kind of reared its ugly head, but not nearly as much as Gen X dudes. I feel like Gen X dudes were just whipping, just whipping boys for, for so much because they, they were from the settler generation for sure. Yeah, and because the question is, are you going to be satisfied and happy in life if you don't follow your own path, because there are going to be multiple forces in your life that are going to try and dictate what you should and shouldn't do. And the problems with that screen is still frozen. I don't trust it. But the problem with that is like, this is why I didn't join the military. I was, I was really pressured hard from a lot of sides to take the, the ROTC scholarship and join the military. I knew the military didn't have shit for me. And that's how I, and that clear early red pill realization that everything the military is offering me, I can do in my own. And I did. I'm like, I don't need the military to learn how to shoot or learn a foreign language or travel or have these experiences or have discipline or be physically fit. Not a single goddamn thing the military recruiters were espousing to me all four years of JROTC involved the military whatsoever. I didn't need these people for that shit. And that's the same with women. It's like, oh, what? Oh no, it's like, what are you, what's being offered? Sex? That's it? Like sex? Like I have to, oh, if you, if you don't put up with all my bullshit, 
And if you don't act, like remove your own spine and submit to me and bend the knee and don't step on my toes, don't contradict any of my opinions, go along with everything I kind of want to do, put up with my mood swings and my and my decades and double digit, you know, baggage that I'm still trying to process through. Put up with all of that if you don't if you want to have sex with me. And that's all they offer. It's like they're not offering to cook or clean or cohabitate. They're they're offering solely sex. And they want you to put up with all this extra bullshit. And it it's just not an incentive enough for most men. I'm not even speaking for myself. It's just most men don't see the appeal with, with sex with modern women enough to actually put up with the effects of being with somebody who's not right for them. If a man knows what he wants and it isn't a modern woman, then modern women don't have power over that man. And that's what we forget. There's power to sex. There's power to the desperation of sexual frustration. But men are not going to commit because that's the question. Men will eagerly have sex with any of these modern women, but they will not commit seriously, especially for any serious, like they might, they might at first, but every dude gets sick of it. Every dude wakes up at a certain point and walks away. The inevitability of marriage relies on the beta guy. The beta has to come along and wife the girl. That's the issue. It's the beta who actually takes the bait. It isn't all of the plethora of other guys who smashed for free and walked away. It is the beta who decides to cuff. That's the guy who you don't want to be. You have to go down your own path because if you are that guy, if you do decide that, okay, this is what I want out of my relationship. This is who I want to be. It's, it's sad. Like it's, I can't see it as anything but pathetic. Like you're going to sacrifice all of this for the vague hope that your wife is not going to leave you within the first 10 years of marriage. It's, I want to keep my eyes open because I know that if I get married, I know that the person I'll get married to is the right person because I will filter all of this other shit that other men overlook in order to find the right person. And that's how people have to see it. That's how men have to see it. That's how women have to see it. Women getting with these guys who they know ain't worth shit, who they know do not care about them that are seeing other women that are promiscuous and then expecting those guys to still be the committed guy like they they want they're like alpha widow they can't believe that this guy who's a millionaire he was so perfect and he just pumped and dumped her and all men are trash and it, it's just again so much of this like this is why again i don't have anything against women i don't have anything and if anything i give men more shit than women because i know what it's like to be a man and i know that men are lacking the accountability but when it comes to the legislature, when it comes to the government, it is so easy to see why men are not falling for this shit anymore. And the, the age of the beta cuck simp is dying. The marriage rates prove it. There's there, there's not enough beta simps to go around to marry these women. There's just not. I mean, the, the betas are running out. The marriage rates are, marriage or birth rates are lowest they've ever been in America, at least. But in the West in general, lowest. Still, lowest. In all the West. Japan, Korea, um, even in China, like you look at Germany, France, Sweden, Norway, Britain, uh, Spain, Italy, Greece, it's like everywhere, everywhere is suffering rock bottom birth and or marriage rates that we've never seen before. It's, it's a, it's a death knell of our society. You're not going to survive negative birth rates. There's no surviving it. There's no way you're going to survive negative birth rates. The, the, the destruction of relations between men and women have gotten so intense that we're not going to survive as a civilization. We're going to go extinct as a civilization. There's no debate. Negative birth rates are not tenable because the only two solutions are mass replacement migration, which will destroy your society, or it is letting your society do to nothing, which will destroy your society. Your civilization will not survive, especially as it was before. I'm like, okay, we're going to have to port another nation's population to what we're not, we're not going to be the same we're just going to become that other nation if we do that it's what happens it's like the franks take over france because the romans allowed the franks to settle in gaul that's why today france is not called gaul or gallia it's called france because who decided it was a good idea to let the franks into gaul or the goths into northern italy or, or the goths into thrace 
the Visigoths took over Italy because of the Fodorati in Rome being given lands as a result of Roman military service. They weren't expected to assimilate or anything, change religions or any, anything like that. Oh, they're, they're the same race, right? Different ethnicity, different religion, different ties, different claims. And those Fodorati ended up conquering Rome, at least Western Rome, in the 5th century. Once, once Rome was sacked, all these other different Germanic groups, the Germanic migrations, were not migrations. These people were already in Roman territory, decided to have a fucking field day with Western Rome. There are a few groups like the Vandals that did come from outside the empire, sure. Yeah, and it's a fair point. History repeats itself. What society? This is my question for you, Emmanuel, and also for David when he returns. What society, what population of animals, what society has ever survived negative birth rates? What society has ever survived the dissolution of the structure of marriage and the nuclear family? Has any society survived that at all? Has a single society survived a negative below replacement birth rate and the breakdown of the institution of marriage? I don't know a single one. It's not the Achaemenids or the Parthians. It's not the Min, Qing, Zhou, Song dynasties. It's not the Kingdom of Wei. It's not the, the Siamese, not the uh, Tibeto-Burman kingdoms. It's not Myanmar, nothing nothing in India. You know, none of the Dravidian or Tamil kings. Uh, I didn't see it in Hindustan. I didn't see it with the Mughals or the Mongols. I didn't see it with the Jurchen or the Zhongnu. I didn't see it with, uh, with the Kazakhs or the Uyghurs. I didn't see it with the Oghuz. I didn't see it with, the, with people from Damascus or the Assyrians. I didn't see it with Rome or East or West. I didn't see it with the, with the ancient Gaulish states. I didn't see it with the Germanic states. I didn't see it with the earliest Balto-Slavic tribes. I didn't see it with the Sioux or the Algonquin peoples of the East. I didn't see it with any of the Nadine people of the West and center. I didn't see what the, where, where is it? Where is it? And I agree. This is why I'm not a conservative. People really get me confused. They're like, you're a conservative. I'm no, I'm not a conservative. I'm a reactionary because shit has to change. That we're not going to save the West. Like the one place where conservatives I do agree with are that conservatives are having kids while liberals are not. In a nation state level, okay, I can see how trends will be such to where the Mormons and the Amish and traditional Christians, they will begin to outnumber the atheists who don't have kids. Will we survive the recession that results from the I Because honestly, the current generation producing all the money is retiring away. Gen X is the last generation that actually represents a pinnacle of wealth that was seen in the 20th century. Millennials are broke as shit. Oh, we're going to inherit the most property. No, we're not. Your parents have sold most of that shit. It's good. They're going to sell it before they get old. We're in line to inherit the most property, but are, is that property going to stay in our family? Probably not. Probably going to sell that shit. They're probably going to live to their 90 and then sell that shit, you know, to pay for the last 10 years of their health care. Refinance. So it's like, okay, do you want a mortgage? Because, uh, yeah, I want to I hang on to the last vestiges of life till I'm 100. You know, fuck you, all my kids and descendants. And that's how it is. But millennials are millennials are broke, man. And the idea that the West is going to turn this path around, I'm like, yeah, sure. I mean, we're going to survive. It's not like we're all going to go extinct on the continent. But we're not going to exist as the same nation in any respect. We're not going to be a global superpower, especially. We'll be lucky if we're a regional superpower. We'll be lucky if we don't balkanize into 50 different nations. The idea that we're, we can save the West is impossible unless unless there is a massive revolution in how people view everything from borders to the social contract there's it, it needs a complete and utter overhaul like and we, there is hope there are societies where things have gone to 180 like in iran but people don't want to become iran they don't want to become you know handmaid's tail but i'm like it's either that or no more current society They'll wonder what happened to us. It'll be like the Bronze Age collapse. They'll wonder what happened to our civilization. Was there a famine? 
Was there a natural disaster? Was there a plague that wiped them all out? No, selfish women who don't want to have kids. If that's the answer, it's going to be the most hilarious and depressing, poignant example of just what happens when a society who deliberately terminates and gets rid of tradition, what happens to that society? If you deliberately decide that, oh, I don't need to have kids. I don't need to have a family. I don't need to do shit. I, I don't need to participate in society. That's what's going to happen. You're not going to exist anymore as, as a people. You're not going to exist anymore as a nation. Without family, the family is the backbone and the pillar of the community. And the community is the backbone and pillar of the nation. And if you knock out the bottom rung of that chain, you are not going to have a community or a society or a nation in any respect. We're going to die out. And it's hard to fucking believe. We're all going to be eating lichen off rocks in a hundred years if we don't reverse the birth rate. Because it, all it takes, recession, or even though the Biden administration doesn't want you to believe this, recession is two quarters of negative GDP growth. Once you go over that demographic hump, this is what people are concerned about in Turkey and Russia and China, because it's happening everywhere. It's not just first world. Everywhere where there's contraceptives and everywhere where people are putting up with condoms and putting up with birth control, you're getting this. It's sad that modern science, and I'm tying this back to science, it's sad that modern science is causes of hyper-focus on shit like climate change and not on the birth rates. The birth rates are going to kill us off faster than the fucking temperature or thermostat will. The temperature raising three degrees is nothing compared to an entire generation worth of negative birth rates. That'll kill more people than any war in history. Abortion alone has killed 70 million American citizens, potential American citizens. Population the size of Great Britain. Gone. Thanos snapped out of existence before they even had a chance to exist. That is, especially if you consider that we're going to live two to three million years average as a mammal species, that is an incredible chunk of future humanity just utterly wiped out of existence because of the actions of selfish women who don't want to take accountability for their actions. It is shocking how much a lack of accountability can affect human history. And this is what so many historians fail to take into account about history. Some things are not rational. Some things make absolutely no fucking sense. And this is one of them. People's deliberate decision to forego family for careers and short-term monetary gain. And it's like, well, America will not exist in 100 years. I guarantee fucking to you that by 2120, there will be no United States of America. There's no way it's possible. The birth rates are at, a, at such a level where it's just not going to happen. Our, our economy will stagnate and then fall through the floor before that ever happens. We don't even have to drop that substantially in population for the working class. The actual work, like amount of people working in our society shrinks and dwindles to almost nothing compared to the mass amount of old people. Japan is experiencing this right now, going through a massive recession, and they're only at the beginning of their woes. They're expecting the recession to be like this for the foreseeable future. Japan hit its zenith in the 90s, and now they're just trying to stay a developed country, basically. But they're doing well because they've stayed homogenous, and their social contract is strong. Meanwhile, we're burning down, we, a bunch of communist Antifa are burning down the cities, Pe most, oh, I'm sorry. Mostly peaceful protesters are burning down our cities every election cycle, every two years. There's massive civil unrest. We're not Japan. Japan's going to survive. I think Japan will survive. There don't, don't might be fewer people. Might get down to like 70 million people before they bounce back. But they'll survive. We're not. America's fucked. America can't even keep itself together more than two years straight. This is a big reason. 40s and 50. Remember most... 40s and 50 year olds already sold this out. And then I've been. It's sad, dude, because we're already getting conquered by our neighbors. Like, the amount of people who I meet who are unironically like uh, La Raza Reconquista people in, in California who believe that California is rightfully belongs to Mexico. I mean, I, I, well, first and foremost, 
I just walk away from those people because it just pisses me off so much. It's just like a slap in the face. But I actually did a project for that for one of my classes back when I studied in San Francisco. Um, I actually did uh, a project on the Treaty of Guadalupe and Hidalgo. And what's unfortunate, bro, and bros and broettes, is that we are surrounded on all sides by Canadians and Mexicans are not our friends. We're our neighbors. We're not friends. America is just a massive country with massive resources, massive uh, technological capacity. It's just, if we weren't so head and shoulders above every other nation on earth militarily, just because we, the role we played in both world wars, we really weren't that involved. They're the only wars that we've ever really won. And it was because we weren't that involved in them. And without that power, as America degrades, our slip, our, our especially our soft power, really starts to slip. That's why China and Russia and Iran or North Korea, they're all getting uppity. They're all getting uppity as fuck because they know America's on the DL. That's downsliding. Yeah. And this is what I've, I heard this when I was a kid in the 90s. People remember America is going to go into history as another Roman Empire. Because what did we see in Rome? We saw the same shit in Rome. We saw the same degeneracy, the same incompetence in politics. We saw the same hubris, the same open borders policy, the same everything. That I, It's like you can't name something. Even, even the role... The role of the home, the breakdown of the nuclear family, all that shit in Rome. Like, people speaking upon the end of the Roman Empire sounds so shockingly similar to today. The hedonism, the abuse of drugs and alcohol, the, the breakdown of religion, uh, just the... And this is mostly in cities, because even though Rome was Christian in the West at its fall, it was the least Christian it's ever going to be then and since, because... There was so much degeneracy and hedonism and excess going on towards the end of the Roman Empire. They couldn't believe that the Fodorati that were such good, loyal soldiers of the Roman Empire would stab them in the back when things got tough. And then look what's happening in America. Things get tough. Businesses get burned and looted. It's like this is why people think America is going to become the Rome of, of, the, West, of the Western Hemisphere. Because the legacy it's going to leave behind is amazing i mean america's history shit dude you like i don't see how america's not going to have an indelible impact on the rest of north america's history for forever from now i can't unless a meteor hits uh the uh, chicks club mexico like it did during the dinosaurs i can't see how america's not going to have a lasting indelible impact every single one of the 50 states is going to be a competent state in its own right if it actually has the impetus to become independent or form a block with other states who knows but even if we fracture into 50 fucking states, man, it's going to create an entire new realm of geopolitics. And yeah, okay, China and other powers are probably going to come to the fore in that power vacuum. But I don't think America's going to remain irrelevant. I think it's just going to be shit to be American for a long time until we sort ourselves out. But yeah, this is why I don't really care about overpopulation or any of that shit. It's like, dude, the problem isn't overpopulation it's the opposite it's like okay the third world is ratcheting it up and, and when they get their hands on more contraceptives and all this other shit and their economy starts stagnating because the foreign investment drives up and like most of the growth being driven in africa and asia and south america is being driven by the first world once we start declining we're not going to see africa you know exploding in population we feed africa without us it's like look at the grain of ukraine that all of africa is having this massive crisis like some of those fertile land on the entire planet like zimbabwe rhodesia used to be the breadbasket of africa one of the most fertile wheat producing areas china's still investing in it and yet people are starving to death in the joes because the communists got rid of all the farmers because they were those white devil colonists they didn't realize we're feeding all the blacks in rhodesia because they were so caught up in this racist narrative they didn't realize oh it was actually white people feeding us all along and not other africans so pretty difficult to to parse history when you see everything through a uh, ism ist faux lens, like like most of the people on the on the hardcore left these days, but yeah, and th we are living in history because even if you take a very conservative stance on the entire human timeline, if you do think that human beings are only going to live the same length of time as the average mammal species of like two to three million years, that's still 
we're still like what one percent through human history just one percent of human history that that's basically all that's elapsed we're so we're so new on the scene even compared to the average mammal we're only through one percent of our history so there's a lot more humanity to go i mean yeah we spend the majority of our history fucking banging on rocks but if the future is like space and fucking every science fantasy on steroids then yeah this is not the time to be aborting children you don't you, you might have just aborted the Kwisatz Haderach or some shit like it just I don't even know but yeah but you can only be down for a certain amount of time and Central America is one of the original regions for civilizational growth and anywhere you find a civilizational nexus, you always see a rise and fall of civilizations. It started with like the Olmec, but it, there's evidence that there's a lot of people that even predated the Olmec. Um, but the Amazon Basin and the Andes are another one. But Mesoamerica, Mississippi River, those are those are more too. So it's like we know that there's going to be civilizations that always crop around those areas. In the old world, we see the Indus and Ganges River. We see the Yellow um, and Guangzhou Rivers. We see uh shit like mesopotamia quintessential example nile river valley um but also like even during the neolithic we saw like the danube and the fistula and the rhine become really important river systems so it's like we know the places where civilization is probably going to develop but america is so it still has so much to like there's still so much potential people are like oh what does america produce i'm like america is one of the biggest producers of raw materials ever in history and it's so funny to, that people actually think that America is purely surface economy, but that's deliberate. We've exported all of our manufacturing. We crippled our economy. The people that sold us out and the, all those 40 and 50 year olds, like you said back here, like, oh, they've already they've already sold us out. Most people already sold us out. They sold us out by voting for people and by doing things deliberately that put us at a back foot. The recession is their fault. All this shit with the housing market is their fault. It's like they can't say that it's not. Because it is. Like, who are you going to blame? Us? You're going to blame millennials and Zoomers for the current state of America? No. We have every right to blame you and our geriatric politicians. But yeah, I, I like I, I like this critique through history. The Silurian is really short, so I'm, I'm kind of glad I filled the stream with more of this. Yeah. And yeah, it's, it's just access to resources. At the end of the day, scarcity... And the concentration of, of resources really kind of determines where things are going to be. But there are exceptions to the rule. You know, like now in the modern day, like something like Las Vegas kind of breaks the trend. But Las Vegas is a major hub. And there are incentives like gambling that and just entertainment that made Las Vegas big. But if the global supply chain collapses, I don't see Las Vegas having a population of more than like 10,000 people <laughs> pretty quickly. And that's how civilizations work. It's like one minute, it's a big bustling metropolis. The next moment, it's fucking dust in the sand. And I always think of shit like Mount Rushmore or the Washington Monument. Like, what the fuck are they going to make of uh, all that when America falls? Like, when there's no more America and we're all just a bunch of tribesmen beating beating trees and looking at shit. Like, what are people going to think a couple thousand years? Like, I think, speaking of the Silurian period, just a Silurian hypothesis. Like, 50 million years from now, like, what are people going to look at? What are 10,000 years from now? It's like, I, I'm thinking in a period of, you know, if we're Rome and all the different dialects of English and accents and shit break off into their own little constituent, you know, vulgar English dialects and then become their own little languages, how are people going to view the United States? Like one of the great, I mean, we went to the moon. We, we won two world wars. And... We have all this glory. We have a, a, a fabulous tale of revolution that began everything. We have our controversies, but we also have, I mean, we're the greatest and richest nation on the planet ever to exist, ever. Rome doesn't have a fucking camp. I mean, if America showed up and Rome showed up and we existed at the same time, bro, even a single aircraft carrier strike group with six, I mean, they, I, mean there, I know there's scenarios that cover this, but it's like even the smallest, even like a platoon of Marines could take Rome. Like, it's not even hard. It's like you have a few dudes dropping some mortar fire. You have some dudes in like with 
a couple saw machine guns, like that one airport scene from Call of Duty, and you're clearing shop. I don't care how badass these dudes are. You could go up against 100,000 legionaries, and you'd still fucking kick their ass. You could have a couple Sherman tanks, and you're just like a like an M1 Abrams battalion. It's just you're done for. It's like you have 50 to 100 tanks and then some 1,000 infantry, and you're taking on the largest armies that will ever exist in antiquity. So the firepower, the devastation, the nuclear weapons – I mean, holy shit, dude. It's like nukes and the moon are probably going to be our legacy, but I don't want it to come to that. Like nobody wants it to come to that. But the idea that, yeah, but it's, but th this is what pisses me off. Cause yeah. Okay. We, you can boil it down to fifth columns, outside forces. You can boil it down to the exportation of our industry. But man, I think it's just like the fact that the fact that they got away with actually convincing people to break apart the nuclear family, that they actually convinced people to not have that. It's like the fact that it all is going to come down to birth rates and the slow hemorrhage of population to the abyss of contraception is just that's where it's almost black pilling because you know that there's just no way around it. It's like no amount of. No, and it's like, not to mention, it's like patriotism. We could be as patriotic and nationalist and as far right or left as we can possibly be. You could be full-blown communists like the Chinese. You could be hardcore capitalists like Americans. And if you cannot have a replacement birth rate, you will not survive. It's a question of long-term survival. If you do not have a replacement birth rate, you will cease to exist eventually. Doesn't matter who you are, how powerful you are, how many guns or nukes, how much land, how tall your walls are, massive fortresses. If you stop having babies, if you stop having kids, you are going to go extinct as a people and as a country. Point blank, period, fact. And there's only one segment of the population controlling that decision. Have they been misled and led astray? Have they been getting bombarded with propaganda, both in education and the media telling them this? 100%. There are actors trying desperately to do this. But one thing I cannot stand, and I've mentioned before, is the lack of accountability. I cannot stand the infantilization of anyone in our society. And yet that's seemingly what's going on. Everyone's proud and independent until it comes time to take some damn accountability. And that's where like the Roe v. Wade thing really, really pissed me off because it's like you now have to take accountability on the state level for the actions of what? I have a hard time. I'm not going to call them mothers, I, I, a breeding sows deciding to terminate, terminate their unborn children because, for, for lulls because they don't want to deal with the kids financially. And yet every single woman that makes that decision is just one inch closer to destroying our civilization. And it sounds doomist. It sounds alarmist. But is it any more alarmist than people telling you that Florida's going to be underwater by 2018 and it's not? Al Gore and all his predictions, all these peak oil people, the Greta Thunbergs telling Macron, how dare you? Every time he decided to turn the thermostat, when they all fly their private jets or take their yachts to these places. I don't care. Every Klaus Schwab Every mass world war has nothing on negative birth rates. I want to see a single creature in the Silurian period have negative birth rates and survive in the modern day. Let me see. Yeah, because the point, the way you turn this trend around is by either marrying non-Western women or trying to find the unicorn to break the trend. Because I think disengaging is not the right move. That's where I disagree with a lot of guys who are MGTOW and shit. I do not believe in walking away from the dating game because you know what you want. What are you going to benefit from stopping the, the, the search? Like, keep your mind open. Like, don't get desperate or anything. But you should always keep an open mind and actually look for what you want instead of just giving up there's no point in giving up we didn't get anywhere giving up giving up is how you actually do go extinct you, you do, your will to survive should be greater than uh 
your disappointments getting married. Even if I'm a 50 year old man, I'm still going to try and have a, have kids and shit. Cause I can. Yeah. <sighs> Bruh. There's nothing that kills me more. My little brother said that he's not going to date any, but I'm going to keep this up. My little brother said that he's not going to date anybody under 20 years old. And he's 24. And there's nothing more retarded, bro. Like all my exes, except for one, my German ex-girlfriend was about, was actually almost exactly my same age. Um, but all my girlfriends have been younger than me by like five years or more. Uh, the girl I just dated was 21. So yeah, that's about half a decade difference. And even though like younger girls are definitely a bigger pain. Again, I think that the one, one of the reasons I think like some of the girls think I'm stupid or just they overestimate themselves because they are so young. But you're not a kid. You're, you're not a fucking kid. In fact, like knowing knowing girls from when I was a teenager, it's like this idea that like, oh, sex is traumatic to to kids or whatever, like or or that, oh, you know, they don't know what they're doing. You got to protect the children. Like these 13 year old girls were hoeing themselves out when I was in middle school. Like they were they were dastardly, bro. They were demons. And the fact that like if you're going to cut those kids some slack. I'm not going to cut you a single shred of slack being a grown ass voting adult. Like, especially if you're old enough to buy alcohol, you're not a fucking kid. You know, I get called a kid and I'm in my like mid twenties. I'm in my late twenties and people still call me a fucking kid. You know, it's just relative. I'm like, yeah, I'm a, an old one foot in the grave, geriatric old man to a 12 year old, but to some 50 year old, I like, I might as well have just changed my pampers. So honestly, fuck people's perceptions. I'm a, I'm, I'm, a, I'm in the flower of my manhood. I don't give a shit. If you call me a kid, I'll fucking bust your teeth and I'll show you how much of a kid I am. But at the same time, it's like you can't be affected because women will talk shit too. Like they'll they'll try to act like, oh, you're so old. Did a tee hee. What am I supposed to say? I'm like, bro, point me a single period in history where women didn't date older men. And I'll and I'll and I'll point out a textbook that is not fucking working. Yeah. But again, there's nothing wrong. There's there's nothing wrong with 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 people who have their heads on straight, any man that isn't participating in this, any woman that isn't participating in this, it's, they're not the problem. But if you're going to interact with people, it's not you. That's the problem. It's, it's how other people affect you. That's the problem. Cause you're not immune to shit to sit, to just sit here and explain to people. Like, this is another thing. Every man that talks about women says, Oh, don't, don't give a fuck about what women say. Don't give a shit about what they say. Don't care about what they do. Buh, 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 buh. And it's not going to work. What you've got to do is deliberately execute maneuvers that get you away from those women as fast as fucking possible. Get you away from those people as fast as possible. Don't put up with that shit. It will wear away at you. I don't care how resilient you are. The more you put up with bullshit, the more it will wear away at you. So, yeah, I'm not going to let go of my. And that's the way you got to do it. You got to stay consistent. Consistency is the name of the game. You could be working at minimum wage as long as you save half your money if you can afford it you're going to get somewhere eventually like it doesn't matter how broke you are 20 years grinding away at 16 dollars an hour you're eventually going to have a decent nest egg it's going to suck and you might want to invest in other things but you're going to make it david i still get asked for my id when i buy alcohol yeah same i mean i only i i never got asked for my id when uh when i lived in germany now it's just like expected everywhere like i remember even in germany i got id'd for a beer because i was just wearing a big shirt I got ID for ID for a beer, and I'm like, dude, I'm 22, and I just got ID for a beer, and you can be 16 and buy beer. So I got carded for beer because the guy, I guess, thought I was 15. Which honestly, that's the only time I've ever been insulted after getting asked for my ID. I literally was like, seriously, and he didn't really say. He, he saw my ID. He's like, yeah, have a good day. I didn't say shit to him because I'm like, you're a fucking dumbass. Like, in what fucking universe do I look 15? But yeah, there, I, honestly, at this point, it's a point of pride because. Again, comparing myself to all these arrogant jackasses that I knew in high school that are now, I mean, they a lot of them look really whooped. There's some girls from my uh, college days and from high school that still look really good. Like, there's one girl I know who's a doctor. She ended up getting implants, though, which I was like, uh, I mean, it's one of those girls that really is skinny. Like, I, I think she had an eating disorder in high school. She looks better now. But her frame does not go well with, like, double, like, 2C-sized implants. It's just... You're not a size C and never were, not even close. Like she was always like, yeah, baby face. True. That the baby face is real. I think it's the lack of uh 
like really heavy smile lines because these these women they also a lot of them also just they they really don't take care of their skin they get way too much sun i'm like dude if you want to stay young like my my hair is like a fucking sombrero like you can barely see it because uh the sun went down while i was doing the stream now i'm just like a fucking flashlight in my face because i don't want to get up and turn on the lights but yeah i mean like the baby face is real and my kind of demeanor and everything too like it helps the way i dress it's like i'm very very skaterish with how i dress too and i take care of my body that's like it's such a it's such a thing that it's just like men and women alike like i don't like to just harp on women i don't like to just harp on men there's so much equal opportunity bullshit going on with both sides but one of the big ones is just not taking care of your body, man. Like you want to be, you want to boost your testosterone levels and not have a third of the testosterone your grandpa did. Then fucking, you know, get outside, do some manual labor, do martial arts, you know, go for a run. It's like, if you have a gut, if you can't see your dick looking straight down, you have a problem. Yeah. True. But remember Edwin does too. And both of us, you know, and honestly, there's nothing wrong with looking older too as a man, because again, age brings respect and a lot of clout for men. And that's again, it's just men and women aren't the same, man. With women, it is not the same. And it's it's depreciation. For men, if you take care of yourself, there is no it's like if anything, men get better with age. We're like wine. We get richer, and oftentimes to many women, we get more attractive. Like men, if you age well, if you take care of your body, you will age well. If you, if you don't take care of your teeth, if you don't take care of your skin, if you don't take care of your muscles, I mean, shit, dude, of course you're going to look like shit. If you don't, t if it's like, yeah, I'm going to lose half my teeth and all my hair. And then it's like, even if you go bald, shave it, wear a tap out t-shirt, go to the gym, get buff. Cool. It's like for women, it's like you can, you can kick on makeup, you can stay in shape, but that only lasts you so long in the dating marketplace. As a man, I feel like I can confidently enter the marketplace at 50 get myself like a 30 year old girl and still give her like a couple kids or something out of her. I don't see a 50 year old woman doing that with a 30 year old dude, but yeah, it's hardcore. I, I appreciate how long this has gone for. This is, I think the longest critique I've ever had. And it's kind of, it's kind of like a hybrid critique slash chop up. And I think once this actually drops, I'm going to, um, split this stream in two, kind of like put a timestamp for those looking to get more into the more uh, civil discussion rather than the scientific ones. But yeah, I'm going to try and uh, do more chop ups um, or rather more uh, more critiques uh, as time goes on. It does take me a couple of weeks to do these critiques, but yeah, there has been a slight hiatus due to some wider societal shenanigans. It just pisses me off. Like I don't, it's like California back in the 70s used to be one of the richest, safest, most open societies. And now you can't even walk down the street without getting fucking mugged by a group of degenerate fucking retards. And it's just, it just pisses me off. Like I'm, I'm so done with California. It's such a fucking shithole. Okay. I'm supposed to pay 25% of my taxes so I can walk down the street and get fucking mugged. Really? Really? I'm supposed to, I'm paying as much taxes as the fucking Dutch. And I can't even be safe walking down to like the mailbox. I'm going to get mugged by a bunch of future doctors and engineers because, oh, we're, oh, we're, we're, we're all inclusive. We don't want to ruin these men's lives by making them catch charges. It's just honestly, dude, fuck California. Like I can't wait to get the fuck out of this state. And like, unless things really change for me here, then yeah, dude, move to a different state. And also very true. I do have my discord. Um, let me see. I could send the invite link. Um, I'm probably going to post it in the description, but there is the discord. I don't know where my phone is, but oh yeah, I'm kind of a mess right now. It's super dark in my room, but yeah, hundred percent. And then yeah, move into a different state. I, I have seen a lot of people asking about Texas. Um, yeah, I, th I, there's some parts of Texas that I really do like. I actually want to see what Fred um, Fredericksburg looks like. Because it's uh, where all the Germans are at. But I also like the idea of, um, I don't know, moving closer to to the Mississippi. Because I, I just, I don't know. I don't want to live in the arid part of Texas. That's a big thing. Like, I don't want to live in the north of Texas or in the west or south of Texas. But I'd, um, I'd definitely, like the center of Texas and also the Gulf Coast, 
I, I fuck with that. I kind of I kind of like the the jam there. But yeah, all right, there you go. Native California moved to Texas. It makes more sense. Like I know a lot of people who decide to move to Texas, and for me, it just it does make more sense. My brothers are all more on the East Coast. Like my little brothers in Virginia, my other older brothers in Georgia. So there is some incentive to make me go there, but I don't know. If I'm not going to live in California, I kind of want to live overseas, but Europe is so cucked right now. Yeah. Yeah, true. Because, I mean, these bubbles, these neighborhoods in California are bubbles. You get caught up, so caught up in the local bullshit nonsense that you, you, you lose the, um, what is it? It's what's that saying? You lose the uh, ah, it's like you lose the something for the trees. I don't know what the saying is, but you you just yeah, it's like you get trapped, and it's like the ghetto the ghetto life that that street life. Like, cause I I was born in the hood, um, basically back when the hood was the hood, uh, where I live, but. It's insanity now. Like it was bad in the nineties with the violence, but now it's like there's shootings and barber shops and places that it's because of the Bay Area exodus. Like the Bay is so much the ground zero for most of this shit. And LA is not any better. But with the cartel running amok here and with like the street gangs getting new infusions of drugs and guns and human capital to push. It's like all of these like so in Oakland you have the street gangs, but also just a lot of general gang members, a lot of a lot of Crips and Bloods, a lot of a lot of the Kings, a lot of the MS13 niggas are still pushing, bumping around, and they're all being supported by the cartel. So you're seeing the same shit you saw in the 90s. This is why the homicide rate's gone up. All these gang members were being financed by the increase of meth and prescription drugs and codeine syrup and shit that's flooding over the border. No one cares about weed anymore. No one cares about weed and crack cocaine. It's all prescription drugs and meth amphetamines. Because in Mexico, you can get that shit right over the counter. Prescription my ass. You can get all that shit right over the corner. It's like there's no protections. They can make meth easy as fuck in Mexico and then they just ship it over the border. And yeah, and that's true. You I I'll I'll I think I'm it's I'm about to hit the four hour mark, but I do want to wrap up with this. There's never a better chance to make your life better than right now. The present, there's no time like the present. Like, honestly, it sounds extremely fucking lame. And it doesn't mean that you can take those steps immediately, but there's always a way to improve your current life standing. I made a lot of hard ass decisions in the last six months in terms of what I wanted to do with my life. And being a gangbanger, being a gangbanger, soon with these gangs like yeah early 2000s compton there's gang bears on every corner yeah first of all this is why you stay strapped this nigga poppy does, edwin does not want to carry a gun so that just happened he doesn't want to carry a gun or a knife i have my knife it broke let me show it on the stream my knife is not doing too hot Dang, dangly knife so my my knife is kind of kind of shit i have to get a new knife but i do want to eventually get a gun when i'm breaded but yeah but i mean that's true and then i, I actually want to highlight this one you gotta wake up eventually you got it you gotta realize that the gang life ain't gonna ain't gonna do shit for you my both my older brothers doing that the hard way the gang life is stupid because you'll probably be an active gang banger maybe for 10 years before you get killed or put up in the prison for the rest of your life. That means that most of these gang members don't make it to 25. They start gang banging when they drop out of high school. Yeah. Get a gun. True. I. The only reason I don't have a gun yet is because... Uh, yeah, I mean, this is fair enough. The gun, the, night, the gun laws in Cali are fucked. The thing is, I don't believe in gun laws... Just saying, I think all mo most gun laws are actually actively unconstitutional. There's no constitutional basis for 99% of gun laws besides the one that allowed them to be sold. So 
I don't give a shit on how I get a gun. I don't give a fuck about registering a gun. I don't think gun registry should be a thing. Uh, so pff, I don't give a fuck, dude. I mean, there are multiple ways to skin a cat. Um, life has many doors, Fed boy. And I'm not going to enter myself in an ATF database if I don't want to. But yeah, you've got to stay strapped. Like I wouldn't be in Oakland without a fucking gun. Hell, like I feel stupid even being here without a gun. Like I, I at least need my knife, but I guess I'm I'm more assured because of martial arts, but martial arts are going to stop you from, you know, some dude jacking you. But this is society we live in, fellas. It's hard as fuck. And sometimes when you think the chips are the most down for you, that's that's when you have to take lessons out of shit. You get hard breaks. Like life doesn't treat you well. Like my last time being in Germany this last year, that six months, both before, during, after the entire pandemic, it's all struggle. And I think a lot of people have gone through the struggles and I feel like it's broken a lot of people, but I feel like it's strengthened a lot of people too. If you don't actively seek out a better life, no one's going to hold your hand and do that shit for you. Oh, I, I think you're giving my midnight lit streams a bit too much credit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I can see that. Um, I think the entire, what I see a lot from the, the grifter movement, again, I don't make these streams to grift. Like, I know that a lot of the big guys in the game that do streams that I know of personally, like, I know that Drex put me on, and I know about Drex through Nick Ricada. Um, and I know that other people who stream, like I know a lot of, most of the other streamers I know, ironically, are those um, anime VTuber types and the ASMR Twitch thoughts. And I, I a lot of other gamers and stuff, but I just, like, for example, I can't imagine ever putting any sponsored ad content in any of my videos. And I can't imagine um, putting a fuck ton of ads, for example, on my stuff, like, if I get monetized um, or whatever, maybe I'll put an ad up and just recommend you get ad block or something. But like one of the things that make me cringe so hard with these guys who get really big is first the expectation of super chats. Like I'll always, I'm pretty sure show chats that are relevant. I'm not going to make anybody have to super chat me to put up a comment. Like I think that's so fucking pretentious and I kind of hate that shit. Um, that's why I kind of like um, Viva Barnes's uh, streams because he will just be like, he'll he'll do the same thing, um, and just like yeah, like ha pulling up a chat. Like you don't have to pay five dollars to do that. You know, David doesn't have to give me ten bucks to appear in my my precious stream because you know only those who pay can play type shit. I've always kind of hated the grift on YouTube, and I'm I'm not really doing this. Um, uh, for, for any sort of monetary gain, nor, nor do I really think that that would be enjoyable if I did, like, if this was my job, yeah, I could see how this would be a great career. Uh, but if I get big, man, I want to, I want to get big because people like my message. I want to, I want to get big because I want people who just blindly swallowed this evolution narrative to kind of wake up and realize that what they're being taught in school and in university isn't the fucking truth. And I want young men and even older men, I don't give a fuck to, to show up and realize like, yeah, man, if you want to get through life in general, there is accountability that has to be taken. You have to recognize and open your eyes to those who want to manipulate and take advantage of you. And unfortunately, that mostly applies to women and the government right now. That's just the truth. But it also applies to institutions like educational systems. It applies to um, even foreign national governments. It applies to family members, um, even religious institutions uh, that just you know want to go against you or even that ones that you belong to people that you trust that have violated that trust. So pay and play is the strip club rules. I will strip. Um, I, I will strip uh, if I ever decide to stream on like rumble or something. I don't know YouTube's rules for, for stripping, uh, but I'll try. And yeah. And I, I appreciate it. Emmanuel. I, I, I like the fact that both you guys show up. It, it does make it a bit more engaging than uh the original long-winded rants that used to go on. But I, I get it. I, I think I think the main impetus of 
I think the main impetus of many people kind of starting off at first and being kind of like the the wonder who channels. I, again, so many people have had the same take. One of the guys I I, I saw originally who had who were kind of like this, where I think like critical and like Mr. Beast or PewDiePie or some shit. Like these guys who stay kind of humble at first and then sort of change up. But I feel like they always were kind of like they were gaming channels and stuff. I don't know if my uh yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah, and it's 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 something where if you guys are getting something out of it, then I don't I don't mind creating content. Like at the end of the day, on one hand, it is personal, and yeah, I have to give Drax a big a big shout out for helping put me on because honestly, I didn't expect much. Like I I even forgot that I had a YouTube channel um, when I first appeared on stream, and he's like, "Oh, do you want to give a shout out?" And at that time, I don't even think I had posted a chop up yet. I think I had like a couple of my critiques up and then I finally decided to drop it. But I did the chop ups originally too, uh, mostly because I wanted to preserve the conversations I have with my friends. Because because me and Edwin or even Steven and I, like Steven and I reconnected with after years, but me and Edwin have those kind of conversations all the fucking time. Like we would be like the same thing that we did on stream. Like we would go to like, flight radar 24 we'd go on to different um stock and coin exchange markets and check out the market trends we'd go over current news and events we talk it's like we would always have chop ups and these chop ups would happen in public places like they would happen in a smoke a, co- uh, a smoke shop in amsterdam or they would happen on the bus in in stuttgart or some shit like they would happen in places that were often out in the open and then we're, if we're home during the pandemic we got way more into like doing the kind of format that we did now. So about a year before I even created content for this channel with the chop ups, I was already basically doing chop ups with the, with the homie. So I'm glad that some people, some people picked up on it. Yeah. (laughs) Modern time society with biology. Yes. And it's, it's shocking because the correlations and the analogies are there. Humans. I'm not convinced humans are animals. But the concepts that exist in biology are sensible, like they're reasonable, they're valid, and they make sense. Um, yeah, and again, I'm I'm actually open. I want I want there to actually be a chop up that involves more guests. That's how I got um, my buddy Steven on here. But it's the same thing. Like, I'll try to have more uh, actual guest opin- opinions. Yes, yes, indeed, he is. And yeah, so I want to, I want to actually have more, more guest opinion, uh, um, appearances and stuff. I'm open to that. I'm not, I mean, again, bro, like this is, this is the most random ass corner of YouTube you'll probably find. I don't think there's a more who YouTube channel than me out there right now. I'm literally Afro who, who it's literally my namesake, but yeah, look at that. I'm, I'm, it's darkness, hard to even watch. But, ooh, ooh, now you can see on the, on the other side. Yeah, StreamYard's a bit wonky, but I like StreamYard. It's way better than OBS. OBS is such shit. I hated OBS. But, yeah, I, I know for a fact that what we do as people and what we see in nature, there's so many, there's so many comparisons. Yeah. Anyone can join in the chat, you know, anybody like I, I can even drop the stream yard link. I, I know for one of these chop ups, definitely I want to get um, a lot of guests joining. I don't I don't really care. Um, so caring. I there was a hater, David, you missed you missed one of our earliest and first haters that came from a, a shit post that I made. And it was really funny. They missed well, what was it? I have to go back. It was the last stream, the last chop up. It was really funny. This motherfucker, I, what did they misspell? They came in and they, they talked shit, but they misspelled the, uh, oh God, I really ripped them a new asshole too. It was really funny, but haters are fun. I love, I love getting haters. But the thing is, is that there is no, there is no reason to explain it. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. I mean, you can go back and watch it. I think, I don't know. I for, I, I have to go back and timestamp it, I think. To find it yeah oh that's really sweet i i appreciate it emmanuel and because what i try to what i try to propose 
are not things that are based in raw speculation. I want to be able to relay information that's relevant to people in their lives. So if you, if you can figure out and point together, like, what does monogamy look like in nature? Like, this is what I pointed out with Drex. You know, what we see from birds who represent monogamy is that one partner will guard the other. The male role, even though the monogamy is expected, they pair bond or whatever they do in the courtship ritual, it doesn't mean shit unless the male is persistently looking after his female, reproducing her when she's ready. But most of his job is just shadowing her to make sure she's not fucking other dudes or getting into shenanigans. It's like if, bro, if fucking tit mice can figure it out, why can't human beings? And that's the only point I was trying to make with Drex. Because I understand that, like, because uh, he had Andrew who was, like, a lawyer. And he has a law perspective. And he goes about that. And he also has um, a lot of guests who have experience directly with relationships. Because I know that Make Time Podcast is mostly focused with that. But I never saw, yeah, it is mate guarding. But what I saw was a lack of proper... And this is what made me have the, the incentive to get on there. I lacked It lacked the proper connection to the natural world that I think gives a lot of this more credence. Because, yeah, you could say this Manosphere shit is a bunch of red pill mojo. Like, I was about to say mojo jojo. I said mumbo jumbo. It's not the Powerpuff Girls. It's not a bunch of mumbo jumbo. These are things that we see in nature. Like, is it unreasonable to expect your girlfriend not to have nights out with the girls? Like, are you not supposed to look after your girl? I was like, oh, I, I, I can have male friends. It's like, mm, no, you can't. If you want to be in a relationship with me, you can't. I'm not going to let you go on dates with strange men and be in a relationship. It's like guys that are just guys who know what lines in the sand they want to draw are being gaslit by women who act like it. this is, oh, but it's natural. This is totally normal. But in nature, we see the opposite. We see mate guarding behavior. We see uh, cheating behavior in monogamous species. We'll see hypergamy. We'll see all these other things that it seems like human human beings engage in, especially when talking about one sex with the other. When it, we have to be careful because not all things apply one to one. But it ain't a tough sell to look at systems of monogamy and relationships in nature and draw very poignant comparisons between human beings and, and animals that, although it doesn't necessarily speak to the in intelligence of people, but the raw nature and the, and the nature of sexual selection is very much precedented in nature. Sexual selection is still a pillar of microevolution micro that is observable and testable. And to what extent humans are affected by sexual selection remains to be seen. You know, there's, there is a selection bias towards you know, certain heights or builds, whatever, in certain areas versus the other. But, yeah, and these two are good. There is that clash between traditionalism and modern times. But the clash is, again, this is something that's being promoted in the media primarily. The clash isn't really, you know, there aren't a bunch of Catholic, uh, hardcore Catholics and then atheists taking to the streets and battling it out like Autobots and Decepticons. It's mostly media-driven bullshit to attack tradition. And then the modern aspect is what's chic and with it, not actively what's destroying us from within. So that's that's what's heavy. And again, it's ignoring biology. Like, okay, it's how does a population deal with the population not having kids? It's a disaster. Like like if the if the population of let's say what? If the birth rates for the emperor penguin were at 1.69, like it is across the EU, like if the birth rate for the for the for the brown pelican was at 1.9, point one below replacement, scientists would be losing their shit talking about the inevitable and imminent extinction of crucial keystone wildlife, and yet when the same shit applies to human beings or your modern country, you're like. Oh, big deal, at least for combating uh, overpopulation and not realizing the effects of what it does to your country. So it's not even that there's a clash between traditionalism and modern times. It's just people who refuse to listen to common sense versus those that are just trying to do the same shit that they've been doing basically forever to make sure the country functions. So this is where, for me, it's very easy to see which side to pick. It's like there's the people who've been doing 
what works for centuries and those that want to irrevocably fuck up and change our society. Mm. Yeah. It's, it's, it's the redefinition too of what a recession is like two quarters of negative GDP growth is, is a recession. It's always been that definition. And I know that because I was here around the, for the last recession where that was the definition of recession. The thing about the thing I find egregious is the attempt to memory hole, literally everything like memory holding all of the climate change predictions that didn't happen by Al Gore and all these other scientists like peak oil, in the seventies was predicted then peak oil in the nineties was predicted then peak oil in the 2020s was predicted. 2020 was supposed to be another year for peak oil and still not peak oil. And memory holding shit is so egregious because last recession, that's what was used to define it as a recession, not a depression. It's not a depression. It's only two negative quarters of GDP growth. It's a, it's a recession. And then fast forward to the modern day. And now a recession is a recession. When Biden was, I guess, becoming a president from vice president suddenly makes you change the definition of words like you're Aladdin. It's like, oh, it's not an Aladdin recession. It's an Aladdin recession. So you gotta be, you gotta be really technical. But nah, bros, I, I do appreciate you guys stopping by. Um, I guess if you have any last minute questions or concerns, I, I guess post them, post them here. I've been going for four hours and 15 minutes. My room's completely dark, but I, I do appreciate it. I hope you've gotten a lot out of it. Um, and yeah, I, and, my, and if there's not another format, I'm going to try and have, uh, try to have the, the crew together and, and try to pitch this also, I guess, I think maybe in the next week, like, yeah, I have, I have a lot kind of going on. I'm like, I'm starting um, a new job, still a notary and everything, but you know, the hustle never stops. So I I'll try to, I'll try to post more consistently. Uh Oh, where, where did I put myself? Oh, there we go. So I'll, I'll try to uh, post up more consistently, but um, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Thanks David. And yeah, I'll, I'll also have the discord um, posted in the description. I think I had it posted in another one, but yeah, I'll try to post the discord in the uh, description in case you want to get on that. And I'll try to post more consistently. So definitely uh, depending on how my schedule looks, I'll try to work something out, but I'm going to aim for Friday or Saturday night for either my critiques or my chop ups. I, I find that the critiques typically happen whenever I'm able to do the research for it, but it works out great. All right, guys, it has been a blast. Um, I'm glad I'm glad that everybody's uh, decided to drop by. It's been a fun one. And yeah, I'd say, guys, uh, the one last piece of advice I guess I'll leave you with is don't be don't be afraid of trying new shit. Like no matter how old you get, no matter how insecure you feel like you are, like, bro, if you have to live out of a ditch, eating maggots out of logs to pursue your dreams, then fuck it. Because life life really is too short. Like, there's so much bullshit you could be dealing with but don't have to. And just, like, seeing people who actually fuck up their lives. Um, every single person I've seen who's done it, they fucked up their life by settling. They fucked up their life by giving up your, their dreams. They fucked up their life by abandoning what they knew were key foundational principles to their self-actualization. So if you stay on your grind, bros, and you keep pursuing what you know you love, yeah, like I said, cope and breathe, not cope and seethe, bro. You got to cope and breathe, and you and you do only live once. You got to yellow the right way. Cope and breathe. If you're gonna hope to huff the copium, bro, huff it on your own terms. You know, puff that copium like there's no tomorrow, and realize that tomorrow is going to be a better day. The black pill offers you nothing. There's nothing good about being black pilled. We have to look forward, but you have to be realistic. You don't get anywhere in life by being blind and marching straight into things without any preparation. Things are going to be bad, but if we look after ourselves and look after each other, things are going to be good. But yeah, I appreciate you guys stopping by. It's been great. I'll hopefully see you next week. But in any case, guys, like, I hope you really take care. We're going to make it, bros. Going to make it. So see you later.